Are you good? Okay. Good evening. Welcome. Welcome to the February 19th meeting of the Soquel Creek Water District. Um, roll call, we'll find all of the directors present. And our first item on the agenda is a public hearing um, to consider adoption of water rates and fees. Um, and we're going to have an introduction um, by several staff members and the consultant, and then there will be an opportunity, it'll be an, a public hearing for you all to speak. Um, can I just get a show of hands of how many people would like to speak? Okay, thank you. All right, so take it away, Ron. Great, well um, thank you, go ahead. Just real quick before we get started, for those of you who would like an opportunity to address the board on this issue, we're asking that everybody complete comment cards um, Tracy Hart right here has them in her hand. If you would like us like to speak and have not filled out a comment card, she's happy to grab one and hand it out to you. So if you could turn that in for her, that would be great. If you have a comment card that you'd like her to pick up, just go ahead and raise your hand and she'll be happy to grab it from you. Yes, and, you, and if you have a protest letter uh, that you'd like to turn in, um, yeah. You protest letters can be turned in to Mr. Basso or our protest officer, Emma Olin and they all need to be turned in by the close of the meeting this evening. Okay. So great, all right. Thank well, you. All right. I wanna thank everybody for coming and expressing your viewpoints tonight. Um, we'll get, our, get that first one up. Um, uh, I'm gonna give a quick overview. Uh, our finance and business manager, Leslie, is gonna give a kind of nuts and bolts for the district and then our consultants are here in the crowd and they're gonna get down into the finer details about how they develop these rates. So who likes rate increases? I was gonna pose that as a question, but when I was writing it out, it, it's really a statement. Who likes them? Nobody likes them. I'll even confess, when I get my uh, water rate hikes in the, in the mail and, and I get them from another agency, uh, I, j I just have this kind of visceral reaction, regardless, and, and I know that what they're doing, they need, the, they need the money for the infrastructure, I know that, but it's just a common thing I think we all experience. I was thinking about why, you know, why, and I think it's just we want people to be more efficient and better. So, so with that idea, next, I think we as a society think that way. Here is the American Society of Civil Engineers report card. This is from 2013, but I got a sneak preview of the one being released in March 6th, and it's not much better. We do a very poor job in the United States, California, uh, in investing in our, in our infrastructure. It's a D plus, and if you look down here in the bottom right, water gets a C. Now this is on a, a United States level, but California also, when it gets rated for water, it gets a, a, a D for infrastructure, for not investing in its infrastructure. And I don't know, a few years ago, they were uh, out in the seascape area, our people were, and they were digging up uh, some of the water lines. This is what your old, old water lines look like. This is a piece of redwood with wire around it. So it'll be in a museum soon, so. Um, so we're continually upgrading uh, to get better, to try to do better than a D. I think if anybody's kids brought home that report card right there, it wouldn't be the uh, proudest moment um, in our lives. So what's the district done? Uh, how's it approach rates? And this is a conceptual model, but I think it's really kind of the nuts and bolts what I wanna share with you tonight. I started in around 2003, 2004, and early on, the board had the discussions of, uh, we know we have a lot ahead of us. We have uh, to supply good quality water and we have a, a water supply issue, seawater intrusion uh, to address. And that's gonna, that's gonna take a, a major effort. So what the board decided back in early 2000 was to do what that blue line does, steadily increase rates. Otherwise, they saw they could take that approach of that red line, go along for a while and then spike it up. And my argument to you is that while we've taken the blue line, I would say most agencies have taken the red line and I'm gonna show you why. Go ahead. In 2000, uh, you'll see, I've seen some signs around and I think they're right probably in around 2015, 14, that era early on, 
we had the second highest rates in the state. That's because we were doing that early investing of our infrastructure so we could be poised for uh, a project or projects to prevent seawater intrusion. So here is a graph of uh, monthly water bill comparison, at, assuming you use the average, what people averagely use, six units of water, a unit of water is 748 gallons, so a typical resident uses about six units of water per month. And you can see along, uh, the uh, along the bottom there, there's different water agencies or water purveyors, and we're the red one. So Central Water District gets the prize for being the least costly, Scotts Valley next, City of Watsonville, inside the city, then outside the city, and then just to the left of the red is City of Santa Cruz inside, that's their average uh, rate comparison, then we're the red, and then outside the city, the city's more than us, and it goes up to uh, Coastside County Water District, which is up in Half Moon Bay, San Lorenzo, Pure Source, which is a small mutual, Monterey, and Chalk Gulch. But going from 2014 or, or 13, where we were the second highest in the state, this is where we are just locally. Okay, let's, let's take the uh, next slide. Um, this is off a uh, state database, and what this is, is in 2015, when our rates were, you know, probably proportionally higher than they will be. Oh, let me go back one more table. I wanna, I wanna this was a question that was asked, oops. Okay. That red is with the proposed rates, and everybody else's existing rates. So the red is with the Soquel Creek Water District's proposed rates, and the blue is all the other agencies' existing rates. Okay, so that's locally, so the next slide, please. This is off a state database for agencies 30, 000, 30 to 50,000 people that they serve, and that's right in our wheelhouse. Now, this isn't rates, this is an average customer's bill. This is the way it was sorted, and you can see, so one could argue, well, that th somebody might be using more water and have a, uh, a bill similar, that's true, but regardless, this is what they pay, and we're, we're below the average in this database, and I would argue probably no agency's worked harder to help the customers, and the customers have done, no, have done better than probably any other customers anywhere in the United States on saving water. So while we've helped you, you've come through too. Bottom line is our water rate average bill is less than, than average up there. I think that's important because when we think rates or costs, I think we automatically, we're comparing against something, either value or other, a, 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 other agencies. So to me, this is the kind of thing that helps me. And I think I've got one more slide. Yeah, so it's not all just about cost too. It's about value, right? If you buy a refrigerator for $100 and it's gonna last a year, or you're gonna buy one for 200 that lasts 10 years, well, I think you're gonna go for the $200 one. Well, what Soquel Creek Water District faces is abnormal relative to most water agencies. We're not, we're not only tasked with, with supplying uh, high quality, reliable water to you 365, 24-7, uh, that whole bit, and good customer service on all fronts, we have to fight this beast. And this beast is seawater intrusion. Seawater intrusions happen in the majority of the uh, populated coastal regions of the world. This is locally, this is the Monterey Bay. You see that yellow? That's seawater intrusion. The lower part is Monterey. It's in all the way down to uh, almost Salinas there. The upper part is um, Watsonville. It's in three miles inland. The red part, that's our service area. It, it's onshore at either end of the district, and just about a year ago, our district and the Mid-County Groundwater Agency of Santa Cruz had a helicopter and they flew this. It was an innovative technology, and they found where it's not already onshore, it's right offshore. It is knocking on our door, front doorstep, poised to come in. And if we let our guard down, well, it's coming probably right as we speak, but if we don't, not continuous about trying to fight this, supplemental supplies, conservation, well management, it, it will, will look like the yellow. So what I'm trying to stress here is that we're not just providing water, we've got over 80 monitoring wells. We've, we've done the heavy lift for this community 
and we should because we use the majority water out of this basin. We probably use about 60% of the water out of this basin. But this board and, the, and our staff have, been, and Central's helped also, I wanna put a shout out to Central Water District, but have really towed the line in trying to figure that situation out, define it, and fix it. And so, while our rates are average or below average, we've got this on top of it to do. So I just wanted to keep, want you to keep that in mind when you, when you speak tonight, because I think that's, this is, this is the kind of stuff that I thought was important for, for me to share with you, to give the big, broad perspective. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Leslie. Okay. Thank you, Ron. So I want to thank Ron for giving us kind of that big picture overview. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, how we wound up where we are right now in terms of the efforts that went into doing this rate study um, and what those rates are actually to fund. One of the big questions we get, well, is what are our rates funding? What do we pay for? And here at the district, um, we're committed to providing you high quality drinking water at the turn of a tap, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We have a 24-7 emergency response team, so if you need to call us after hours, we're available to meet your needs. We provide conservation services, we provide rebates to our customers, we provide water-wise house calls to show you how to conserve water and lower your water bills. We generate bills to about 15,800 customers. We answer thousands of phone calls a year we repair main leaks and service line leaks. We have 173 miles of mains in the ground to serve you with water. We re rehabilitate wells. We have 19 production wells and they periodically need to be re rehabilitated to keep them running at, at peak performance. We uh, replace pumps. We have about 100 pumps and they need periodic repair and replacement. We recode our tanks on an ongoing maintenance schedule and we have 18 tanks and so they have to be um, maintained and recoded in order to prevent them from um, corroding and affecting the quality of your water. We uh, need to construct a new tank at Quail Run in order to provide some resiliency to our system and to be able to move water uh, from service area to service area. We're replacing a cast iron main along Soquel Drive. That's been a huge project for us and it's ongoing. Um, we have nine treatment plants. We have 5,000 valves, like I said, 15,800 meters. And in 2018, we performed 13,000 water quality tests for over 200 constituents just to ensure that you have safe drinking water. So that's the work that your rates fund on an ongoing basis. One of the other questions we frequently get about this particular rate study is what are we doing in terms of long-term water solutions? And I've got three slides up here. Over the past couple of years, we've been actively working on about three supply projects. We've been working on a stormwater uh, recharge project and that work is ongoing, but we have discovered that that is probably not going to be a comprehensive solution to our water needs. Um, but it will be part of a water si supply portfolio if we can find a, a prime opportunity for recharge. We've been working on water transfers with the city of Santa Cruz and that work is ongoing. We've been working cooperatively with them on opening up a pilot inner tie and doing some pilot water transfers. That relationship is built on trust. Um, we have to trust that the agency that we're working with knows what their water supply issues are, knows how much water they can provide to us and at what cost. We're also working then on the Pure Water Soquel project and that's the project that the board actually approved in December. <coughs> and that is a groundwater replenishment project to use advanced purified water to inject into the groundwater basin and create a barrier against the seawater intrusion that, that Ron talked about. And there is a sense of urgency here because that seawater intrusion is occurring in our aquifer right now. So we've been spending a lot of years, I know since I've been with the district, we've always been working on supply options and trying to evaluate what's out there 
and what will work best for our aquifer. The name of the game here is resiliency. So we're trying to build a resilient aquifer. Anybody who's investing in their future in terms of investing for retirement, investing for, um, to make a return on their investment, the key to doing that is actually diversification. You have to diversi diversify where you're putting those efforts, where you're putting your money. And the district and the board has taken the same approach to our long-term water supply options. They're looking at all available options. And if other options become available, they'll probably look at those too. But right now our prime candidate is the Pure Water SoCal project. So when we formulated this particular rate increase, we looked at that project over the long term and built that one into our five-year finance plan. One of the benefits of doing that is um, it is a capital project. So when you're looking at investing in a water supply solution, there's two ways you can go. You can invest in something like water transfers. Water transfers is not a capital solution. It's an operating solution. So that would involve us paying another agency to transfer water to us. There's no way to get grants on that type of solution, so there's no way to mitigate the cost to our ratepayers. There's no way to get long-term financing on a solution like that because there's no asset being created. So it's strictly an operating cost. That money flows out the door year in and year out. An, an option like Pure Water Soquel is a capital project we have the possibility of getting grants for that project to the tune of about half the cost of the project. When we developed our rate study, we actually developed it for the full cost of the project, assuming no grants. The reason we did that is because when you go out for a rate notification, you cannot raise rates higher than you have noticed to your customers unless you go back out for a subsequent notice. So we included the full cost of the project, knowing that that was as high as we could go. But if other funding opportunities became available for, to us in the way of grants, that we could ask the board to review our financial situation and adopt rates lower than we've noticed. So that's why the full cost of the project was included in the rate study. Just to give you a little bit of an idea of the effort that went into this particular rate study, this was a two-year journey. We started back in May of 2017, and we formed a Water Rates Advisory Committee. And that committee was formed of district customers. We mailed out notices to all of our district customers and asked for people to volunteer to participate in this committee. We thought we were gonna pick up about two candidates, and we picked up 11. So we expanded the scope of the committee so that all 11 customers that were interested in serving could participate. We also had two members of the board of directors on there and then pertinent staff that were working on the rate study as well. And the focus of this committee was really to take a look at the rate structure. Um, they identified some goals for setting rates. Those goals were fairness and equity to the customer, legal defensibility, they needed to be conservation-minded and encourage us to use that water wisely. They needed to be financially sustainable so the district could maintain ongoing operations. And they needed to be easy to administer and, and easy for our customers to understand. So those were the goals that we went into this overall rate evaluation thinking about. These goals were decided upon not only by the customers that sat on our committee, but by the board of directors as well. And during that two-year journey, we did look at some other rate alternatives, and we evaluated, uh, we evaluated a rate structure that we called Customer Select. And it was a rate structure that was developed in North Carolina out of UNC Chapel Hill, and it had never been tried in California. One of the issues that we run into when we're looking at something like this is in California, rate setting is governed by a statutory requirement called Proposition 218, and that tells us how we can devise and administer our rates. And so in order to come up with a rate structure that was legally defensible, we had to look at it under the statutory requirements of Proposition 218. We hired Raftalis Financial Consultants to assist us in developing rates, and they actually worked with us quite a bit on this 
rate alternative to see if it was viable. Um, there are some challenges that we ran into during, during this process. Uh, devising a new rate structure under Proposition 218 is not easy. Uh, as we neared the point where our, our board needed to make a decision about which rate structure they wanted us to ultimately pursue, we had to take a look at customer select and understand that it had never been tried in California. We didn't know how many legal challenges we would get to trying something that new and untested. And so we decided that because we were running out of time and we need to really consider some of these other rate goals like, like simplicity and administrative ease that the customer select was something that we would continue to evaluate but we probably wouldn't be able to pursue at this time. It's at that point that we decided to take a look again at the tiered rate structure. In the past we've had a four tiered rate structure. We looked at it again and it was decided that we could legally defend a two tiered rate structure. So those two tiers represent um, sustainable beneficial use per household at 5.99 units or about six units per household and anything over that um, actually exceeds our pre-recovery pumping goal for the basin and so it does need to be charged at a higher rate because that's the use that's driving a need for a supplemental supply. So that's where we wound up with on the rate evaluation. So then once we made those determinations, it, it came time for us to communicate to our customers about the proposed rate increase. So on January 2nd, we mailed out about 22,000 um, Prop 218 notices to all of our customers, as well as all of the property owners in our district. And you guys probably received those in the mail. We've communicated with our customers via our website, and we have included um, all of the pertinent information on our website as well as a copy of the Prop 218 notice. We have a copy, the full copy of the rate study if anybody's interested in seeing how those rates were developed. We've also got a rate calculator for our single family residential customers to be able to put in their meter size and their anticipated usage and be able to calculate what the bill would be under the proposed rate. The other thing we did is we included it in our news and updates email blast that went out in February. One of the other things then that we wanted to do was we wanted to take a look at the protest letters that we did receive from our customers. And we got about 230 roughly? 239. 239. And so we looked at each one of those uh, protest letters and we wanted to see if we can come up with some themes that we were seeing recurring in some of those letters. And so we did find about um, four concerns that our customers had. One of those concerns were, uh, were there cheaper water supply solutions available as opposed to the pure water SoCal plan that we did include in the rate study. When you're evaluating water supply options, especially regional water supply options, you have to approach that cooperatively, have trust and respect in the other agencies that you work with. And so we have worked with the city of Santa Cruz on the water transfer project. The information that they provided to us on that project did not lead us to believe that that was going to be a cheaper solution. And again, it was not a solution that we could get grants on and it was not a solution that we could finance in the long term. It would be a, an ongoing operating cost. We also looked at um, the stormwater recharge, and as I said, there are opportunities hopefully for recharge in our area, but they're not a comprehensive su uh, supply solution. There's not enough water to, ha uh, to be recharged that would solve our overall water supply problem. So we did look at some of these other water supply solutions and we feel that Pure Water Soquel is probably the least expensive option we have available to us, especially if we get grants. That could cut the cost of the project in half. Um, we also looked at an economic study done by the, uh, an economics professor at UC Santa Cruz, uh, the cost of doing no project at all and the 
cost to our customers in terms of water rates and economic benefit to the community, it would be about three times as expensive to do nothing at all. So again, we felt this project was the project that it was in our customers' best interests to continue to pursue. One of the other questions we've had from our customers is, is there help for low-income customers? As I was explaining to you, Proposition 218 is the statutory requirement that we have to follow when setting our rates. What it does not allow us to do is set a rate that has to be subsidized by other ratepayers in the community. So if we were to offer a low-income benefit to low-income customers, the cost of that would have to be borne by all the other ratepayers because we don't have any other source of revenue. And that's against the law under Prop 218. So there is a statewide initiative that's happening right now. It's called Assembly Bill 401. And it has tasked the State Water Resources Control Board with looking at a low-income rate assistance program that would assist low-income customers. If that, uh, that's gonna be state law once it's enacted. And so the Water District will be participating in that. We don't participate directly. It's actually something that's administered by the state, but we will be working to make sure our customers know that that opportunity is available to them. And it would be available to customers whose household income was 200% or less of the federal poverty level. So for a family of four, that's gonna be up about a $50,000 household income. If you're less than that, then you probably qualify for the state low income assistance program. So we are continuing to monitor that, monitor that, and as soon as something becomes available, we'll make sure that we outreach our customers and let them know it's available. One of the other questions we've had is, is there something better than a tiered rate structure? And we did take a look at that. Um, we took a, a look at it and spent about two years working on it. And as I said, we developed a customer select plan that we didn't feel was uh, ready for us to roll out at this time. Um, we'd like to continue to evaluate it, but I don't know if it's ever going to be viable under Prop 218, but we'll certainly continue to look at those options. But any rates that you look at have pros and cons. And so we did take a look along with our board at all the rate options and the inclining tiered seemed to be um, the least painful and most effective in achieving those rate goals. And, and let me just say, so there, Leslie, can I jump in for sure. just a sec? So what you see up here are different types of rate structure, uniform rate, decreasing uh, block rates, increasing block rates. That's what we, we're, we're proposing. But let me just give you an example. Uniform rates, that was something we considered too. So that's just a flat rate for every gallon of water, everybody's charged the same amount. So that sounds kind of good, but when you go to a rate like that, what happens to people who can serve uh, and do a good job and don't use much water have to burden the cost of what would be in that second tier. So now the lower users would be paying more. So I just, I, I share that because every, every structure has its uh, tug and pull to it, pluses and minuses. Thank you. One of the other questions we've had from our customers are why are the service charges for larger meters increasing so much? And I know that we've worked with some of the customers who've called in to try and help them understand what, uh, what is going on on this issue. We set our service charges based on um, the hydraulic capacity of the meter and based on the peak, peaking behavior of that particular customer class. So I'll, Sanjay Gower and Kevin Kostiak of Raftalos will be going into more details on how all of that was set. But when we took a look at that and we used the manufacturer specifications for the larger ultrasonic meters, it did have an impact on meters that are two inches or larger. And so we did respond to customers' concerns about that. We have taken a look at what that means for individual households that are sharing one of these larger meters. Right now, a single family customer um, that has a separate 5 8 inch meter, which is our standard size meter, pays a service charge of about 30, 3706, I think is what we're proposing that it go to. Right now, I think they're paying 3295. 
for multifamily income or multifamily residential customers, we took a look at the household impact of the cost of that larger meter. And our ma uh, multifamily residential customers are still going to be paying an average of around 18 to 27 dollars per service connection, which is still about two thirds of the cost of a single family service charge. So I realize that that is a significant increase, but it's not out of line with what our other customers are paying. So we did listen, we did wanna try and address up front some of those concerns that I know were brought up on the protest letters. I've got um, Sanjay Gower and, and Kevin from Raftelis who are gonna give us another presentation that's gonna go a little bit more in depth into uh, the background of the rates and, and how the rates were developed. Thank you, Leslie. So, okay. We'll run the projector for, or the screen, is that okay? Thanks. You wanna do the slide or you want me to do the slide? Uh, Leslie can do it if that's better for you or would you like to do it? I'll can you Can you work it from there? Yeah, I can work it from here. All right. your flow. Did you find it? Yeah, I think so. No, that's me. <laughs> I think it's the one just to the left of it, Sanjay. This one? Yeah. There you go. Um, Thank you, Leslie, President, Board Members, Staff, and Public. I'd like to present um, our presentation associated with the rate study. My apologies that I'm, my back's to you, but as you can see, this is how the podium is set up. Um, we're gonna be going over this presentation, um, talking about the different steps associated with the rate studies, um, and to talk about the process of doing a rate study. So when doing a rate study, first, there's a few steps that we wanna do. The first is what we call the policy objectives and the framework, as Leslie mentioned, we work quite a bit with the advisory group. We also worked with the board, if I recall correctly, we've had four board meetings with you, those were public meetings where um, people could be engaged. We work with the advisory committee quite a bit too, got their input about the policy and sort of the goals and objectives of a rate study. What do we want to achieve with these rates? Um, Leslie outlined the different objectives that we had. Once we've determined what are the goals and objectives, what is the ideal rate structure, what would it achieve, Next, we do a financial plan. Financial plan, as Leslie mentioned, is sort of the cash flow of how much cash we need on an annual basis to fund the operating costs of the district, to meet reserve targets, to meet obligations associated with debt. We also looked at different CIP expenditure levels associated with Pure Water um, SoCal and the ability of having grants and not having grants. So we looked at the different scenarios associated with that. We actually presented that to the board and got your input associated with that. The next step is what we call cost of service or rate design. And that's really the allocation of costs. As Leslie mentioned, rates um, do fall under Prop 218. Prop 218 basically states that there needs to be a logic and rationality with the rates. We need to prove that these rates meet some kind of logical framework. That is done through the administrative record. That's that report that Leslie mentioned. That's uh, publicly available. I encourage the public to look at it and glance at it. It is very tedious, my apologies, but that's the requirement now w with the le um, legal framework associated with rates that we have to show all the different costs, the budget, and how that flows into the actual rates and why the rates are like that. We've also looked at different um, impacts associated with the customers. So we've had a lot of staff discussion. We presented that to you also at a different board workshop. And at the last step is the rate adoption, where we develop the administrative record. Um, it's available to the public. We do the Prop 218, and then today's the public hearing where we receive um, input from the public too. So the legal environment associated with developing rates are really twofold. The first is Prop 218, which was a voter initiative. The voters approved that. Um, there's been court cases that have been going on about water and Prop 218. But basically, it states that there needs to be a logic and rationality with our rate structure. 
We can't arbitrarily charge people a certain amount. We can't unfortunately um, have policy goals associated with certain disadvantaged communities or individuals and have one rate subsidize another. We have to have each of, this is a fee for service. This is not a tax. So since it's a fee for service, every individual needs to pay for their fair share and there needs to be a logic and rationality associated with it. In addition to um, Article um, Prop 218, there's also Article 10 of the California Constitution. That talks about beneficial use. It state, it's in our Constitution first. Second, um, it states that water is, um, should be, we should prevent waste. It's a beneficial use argument that says that we should look at water and see what's the highest value, what's the most important thing water could be used for. And we should dedicate that water for that first. So of course, that's health and safety, and that's indoor needs. And then the next is outdoor, reasonable outdoor needs, and then et cetera, et cetera. So we've taken these two concepts, the cost and Article 10, the beneficial use argument, looking at the circumstances here with the limited amount of groundwater available, and develop the rate, work, uh, rate structure, we believe, that meets both of that balancing act. So the drivers for the rate studies are threefold. Um, as mentioned, the first challenge is, um, so this is, uh, is Sigma, it's called the Sustainability Ma um, Groundwater Management Act. This is uh, based um, from the state that looked at all the different groundwater basins in California. Um, as, we, as we may know, there's certain parts of California where we've actually had land um, fall because of the groundwater being overused. So this is a, a legislation from the state looking, asking people to start managing their groundwater basin. So the, um, the, uh, the district is involved in that with the county um, looking at that program. So that's a one cost driver and trying to prevent um, groundwater and seawater intrusion. The second is the solution, which is a supplemental source, which is Pure Water SoCal, uh, where we're looking at approximately $90 million capital project associated with that. Um, we're also looking at the annual cost, the operational cost associated with that, and we put that in to our long range financial model. Um, and we've also taken into account grants, as Leslie mentioned, we looked at the different scenarios of what could happen, what's the best case, what's the worst case. As mentioned, um, Leslie stated, these rates need to be, um, what we're looking at is the worst case. We're hoping for the best to occur, and if that occurs, then the board could um, implement lower rates than th that will be considered today. The last one is repair and replacement, and this is where um, Ron was talking about sort of the infrastructure, the long-term infrastructure needs. Um, unfortunately, the California, if United States and California uh, is not doing a great job in maintaining the infrastructure needs for water. A lot of infrastructure was built during World War II or during um, when the Clean Water Act came about when there was federal money available. Basically, that car that we've been driving for 30 or 40 years now is done. And the brakes, the tires, the transmission, everything's falling apart. And as a community, this is one of the challenges that we face is repair and replacement and maintaining our system. And unfortunately, we can't assume the federal government will come out and help us. Um, the financial plan, so we've looked at lots of different scenarios associated with the financial plan. Um, we took into account debt. We've wor worked with your advisor, the engineering firms that you've selected. Um, this is the scenario that we've come up with, which is basically a 9% increase in revenue. We've also taken into account the amount of debt, which is quite a bit, $95 million of debt that we're assuming in this scenario. Now again, we're hoping that grants will come in and that we will actually have to issue only half amount of that debt. And that will have a significant savings for the district. Next is um, some, just some visual graphics of the, of the financial plan where we're showing the 9% increases out that's been considered. We actually, the model does go out more than five years, go out seven years. We also sh make sure we want to make meet our covenants, the coverage ratio requirement. Whenever you issue debt, there is some obligation the district has. We want to make sure you meet those um, obligation fiduciary responsibilities. The bottom is the ending balance of cash flow. There's a lot of expenditures and, um, and debt proceeds coming in. So you see the ending balancing moving around and that's just the wording of the contract. One of the challenges whenever you do large capital projects is that you have to have the money in the bank before you can award the contract. So we have to almost occur the money, have the money, award the contract, then start burning it down and spending it. Um, one of the things about financial models is that as you go out in the out year, especially years six and seven, you know, you, you would want to revisit this and look at this and hopefully we wouldn't have to do those kind of rate increases in the out years. So once we've determined how much revenues we want to collect on an annual basis to fund 
um, the solution associated with the seawater intrusion, looking at the capital cost. The next question then is, is how do we allocate that cost? How, what's, what's a reasonable, what's a rational approach given the goals and objectives that we received in front from your advisory community? So what we do is we call a cost of service where we look at the different costs associated with supply, base delivery and meter maintenance. Um, base is just sort of the infrastructure needed for winter time, so basically the infrastructure right now. Then we also look at the infrastructure that's needed for the summertime, that's the additional capacity. We also look at um, meter maintenance, customer service, and then also water reliability. We also ask ourselves what makes sense where that cost should be collected, on the fixed or variable? So as you can see on the bottom, we have volumetric, we have a fixed charge. So what we're saying is that supply, base, and water reliability, that should be a variable cost, uh, which makes sense there. And then the peaking, the facilities that are needed for the summertime, meter maintenance, customer service, that's the cost to issue a bill, having people um, available to answer phone calls, that should be on the fixed charge. And those are allocated differently based on um, customers based on how much they use, how much peaking they do, or how much additional water they use in the summertime versus the winter. Um, there's a lot of numbers here, um, but again, we need to show these numbers to show the rationality, logic with the rates. Again, the report goes in even more detail, but we actually then start breaking the cost. So we want to collect $21.5 million. We identify through the budget, um, working with Leslie and, and the engineering staff, to determine the cost component associated with water reliability, supply production associated with moving that water out of the ground, base delivery, the average demand, max day, max hour, that's that peaking I was talking about that tends to be used more in the summer, fire protection costs, meter maintenance, and the billing customer service, and we identify those different cost components. Um, based on input that we received, one of the challenges is that because of the drought, we went through a significant um, revenue instability. So we want, and at the same time, though, by increasing the fixed charge, we were very um, concerned about affordability. So we do a slight increase in the fixed charge. We're collecting right now 35% of it on the fixed. So we're saying we want to collect 40%. The peaking par characteristics, we did look at each of your customer class and asked ourselves, are they different? Right now you have different um, meter charges based on customer class. Are they similar? Um, based on our analysis, what we're saying is that irrigation really stand out by itself. The other customer class, single family, multifamily, and commercial, their characteristics of how much water they use versus the winter and summer are very similar. Um, and so their meter charge should be similar. Um, irrigation does use a lot more in the summer, so they should have a higher charge associated with that. So um, this chart basically shows you the different rate structure. As I mentioned right now, you currently do have a different meter charge by customer class for single family, multifamily, commercial, and irrigation. Our recommendation is that single family, multifamily, and commercial all collapse into one, given that there isn't really that much difference in the usage. We actually have the billing data of your customers. We did analysis associated with that, and we actually looked at the patterns between winter <coughs> and summer to determine that they are similar. Irrigation did stand out, so they should have their own meter charge. This chart shows you the current and the, with the proposed with the additional 9% revenue that I mentioned. Um, as Leslie mentioned earlier, we also had a lot of discussion about the meter size and what's the appropriate capacity or how much sh should that be. So we actually look specifically in your community at your meters and based on what kind of meter capacity they have. And based on that input, we did it based on that. So it's very tailored to your specific needs um, and your system. And the concept here is, is that even it is, uh, it is true that these are significant increases for larger meters, the concept is, is that those larger meters has the ability to use more water. So it's that instantaneous ability. Even though they may never use it, they could use it. And I know Leslie's been talking about some programs in place to help those people if they want to downsize their meters. The tiered rate structure, what we're recommending is a two-tiered rate structure. We um, looked at basically, well, how much water do we have in the pre-recovery goal? We identified 2,300 acre feet. And then we asked ourselves, well, we have, that's a very limited amount of water. So what's the best way to allocate that water, given Article 10, beneficial use argument for health and safety? 
um, the logic is, is that we should give that to every account. I mean, every household side, every household should have some water for their indoor needs. That translates to 5.999, I, I say six here, um, keep the numbers simple, but that basically that's enough for a family of three or four for their indoor needs. At least that, that people can have that rate as affordable as possible um, given the circumstance that we are in. So we're saying that the tier break point between single family and multifamily should be the same. Multifamily, of course, would increase as there's number of units increase. So if someone had a multifamily complex of 10 units, then it would be the first tier would be 59.99. Um, um, Commercial irrigation, what we're recommending is them, them to have a uniform rate structure. Given how different the water use there is, and it's really hard to identify what they, their beneficial use in some sense is. Water reliability, we estimate that cost to be on an annual basis, um, not on total, $5.5 million. Um, again, that cost is to improve the long-term health of the groundwater basin. So it's quite clear from a cost of service perspective, and again, from Article 10, um, that that cost should be on those people who bear that, who, who bear that need, and that's those are individuals who are in Tier 2. So that cost is in, in Tier 2. Um, for commercial and irrigation, it's a blended rate, a uniform rate. So w our recommendation is to have two tiers um, for single family, multifamily, uniform, for um, non-residential, which is commercial and irrigation. Th when designing the rates now, we ask ourselves, what are the costs that we're covering, as I mentioned earlier, that supply, base delivery, and water reliability? And so now we have, again, some numbers here, but we're showing you the tier definitions, the amount of water we anticipate to be sold in the tier. So again, this is a very analytical exercise that we do. We get your consumption of your customers. We look at how much water they use. Then we ask ourselves, well, how much, if we have these different tier breakpoints, would they be using? We have that information in here. We look at then, we allocate the cost, the supply cost. We allocate the base delivery, the water reliability. As you notice, there's none in tier one, it's in tier two. Tier two has very limited water. Your community has done a great job in conserving water. It's one of the lowest GPCD in, you know, in California. Um, and because of that, it, it, there's not much water there, but the unit cost has to go, goes up significantly. Um, and as you can see then, what we're recommending is that tier one is $6.43, and tier two would be $29.19. Commercial and irrigation, um, if you notice, the supply and base are the same costs. The only thing that's different is the reliability, and that reliability is spread through all the units. So um, that's why it's $4.36. So residential customers, if you use 5.999 or less, you're not paying for pure water, so okay, you're not paying for those costs. Um, next, one, what I wanna show you is a comparison between your current um, rate structure and the proposed. This has the current um, tier definitions that you see. You have the current rates, you have the proposed. Now, this is before the judgment that occurred. Um, as we know, we, we had a judgment. So um, these were the prior the judgment. This is the current rate. So basically right now, with the current judgment you've had, tier one and two is basically the same rate at $6.90. Um, if you notice, the tier that we're proposing, $6.43, so it is slightly, it is lower than your current tier. And then the tier um, two, of course, is higher, because that's covering the cost of pure water SoCal. So what we now show you is sort of a visual graphics of where the break even points are. Um, as you can see, so the blue, the teal bl blue color is your current rate structure. The darker blue is the proposed. If you use 5.999 or less, um, you're basically paying the same almost unit rate or even less in some point cases um, associated with it. If you go above 5.999, it is more because um, now you're paying for supplemental supply, especially at up to 15. And then after that, um, actually you pay um, less associated with this rate structure. One of the challenges with cost of service and Prop 218 is, is that we have to have a logic and rationality, especially, and that's a challenge, especially with your larger users of water consumption, and I'll be talking about a little bit of some ideas that we've talked about in the past about how to deal with those customers. Um, so what we've done next is we actually calculate the bill. So we've changed the, the amount of revenue we're collecting on the fixed and variable. We've changed the meter ratio. 
We've changed the tier definitions. So a lot has changed. And of course, the question is, is well, what does that mean to me as a customer in your service here? And for the board, what's happening to generally to most of my customers? So we actually calculate the bill. For this is only for single family accounts. I just want to make sure we're clear about that. And we're looking at what was the current bill and under the proposed bill, and then do the dollar difference between the two. And then how many of those customers see the difference? So as you can see over here, I'm looking over in this slide, about 12% of the, of the bills, so again, these are not accounts, but bills, um, will see a decrease in, their consum in, in, their, in, this, in this proposal. Around 60% will see between zero to $5 increase in their bill. And then you can see some individuals that will see more. And there are some customers that will see uh, an increase. I mean, that's unfortunately, is a zero-sum game here. Um, in the sense that we need to have a logic and rationality. We try to look at what's the best um, compromise given the legal framework and goals and objectives that we're trying to achieve. Next, what we've done, and this might be easier for some people, some, for some people or the information they would like to see, which is, well, what if I use a certain amount of water? What will my bill be? So what we're showing you here is two, five, seven, nine, and 12, the different, you, and we show you the current bill, the proposed bill, the dollar changed and the percent change. Um, and as you can see, those individuals that use, if five units is sort of the sweet spot, you will actually see a 47 cents um, decrease in your bill. Um, if you do use two units because of the increase in the fixed charge, it does um, slightly increase to $3.17. Um, seven and nine is um, a more of an increase because now you're paying for water reliability, a pure water SoCal project. And then, then you have 12, um, you see that increase. This represents 94% of your customers. 94 of your customers and single family live in this space right here. Now there is a small minority um, that do live above that. Um, that's, this is the remainder. Um, and they will see um, one of the unintended consequences is, is, that, uh, is that, um, that these customers will see actually a decrease in their bill. We've talked about how people who use this kind of amount of water given the water limitation of water supply that you have available. That Prop 218 water rates is not the avenue to deal with these individuals. There are other mechanisms that you could potentially look at, such as penalties. Um, so the other that's how you would deal with these individuals. You can't deal with them with rates, but you can deal with them through other sources and other means, and that's what I sort of suggest you to do to look at. We've also looked at private fire. So there's um, two types of fire services that the agency provides. One is public fire, that's, and those are the hydrants that are on the streets. The other ones are individual, private. Those are mainly used to um, help protect property. Um, and these are the private fire lines associated at, um, for private protection. We show the proposed, the current, the dollar change, and as you can see, there, are, there is a decrease associated with that. And there was I um, uh, forgot about that. There was a, a law uh, uh, court ruling, and so one of the rates did change slightly in there, and that's what you saw right there. Next, um, I want to talk about emergency rates. As we know, one of the challenges that we face in the water community is the hydrological ability of water. Um, this year, we've been blessed. It's been lots of rain. Um, it's been great in California. Snowpack's amazing. While you don't get the snowpack, you do get the, the rain and the uh, groundwater recharge. One of the challenges, though, is, is what if 2015 hit again? As you recall, 2015 was a dry year. Um, it was a significantly dry year, you know, dry hydrological condition in, ca in a Santa Cruz County area. Um, and I, I worked with San the city of Santa Cruz during that time period. And they had to um, actually allocate water, and I know you did the same too. So the challenge is, is that we don't know what's gonna come around the corner. This is a great year. Next year, it might not be. And that's the sort of the challenges that we live with this climate change environment that we're in right now, where the hydrological conditions are swings. We have these really uh, highs and lows. And because of that, w what we're recommending is to have emergency rates in place, adopted, so that you can implement them if they occur. Hopefully, they do not occur. So these only occur when emergencies occur. So that's a hydrological condition, earthquakes, you know, fire where you have limited sources of water available, you would uh, call on these. The challenge with the water system, as Leslie and Ron mentioned, is that you know, we're really paying for the infrastructure costs to maintain the system. And that's what these emergency rates are for. They're really about maintaining the system, 
and going through these challenges that we have. Um, so what we looked at is, is we looked at the tiered commodity rates. We looked at how much reduction would occur, where it would occur. We would also look take into account the different conservation costs, staffing, um, resources that you'll need associated with that. We also even took into account the savings that you would have from conservation in the sense of l reduced electrical costs. And then um, we have the proposed rates here. So these show the different stages. You have five stages associated with the adoption. Um, the targets, they'll go from five to 50. Hopefully you'll never have to implement these stages, but they're in place just in case. We've also looked at the additional conservation costs associated with these stages. Um, next is the emergency rates that we were at would ask the board to look at and consider for adoption. Um, these are the five stages. Again, these won't be in place unless the board hold a special meeting associated with the emergencies um, that would have to take place. The, uh, you wouldn't have to do another Prop 218 hearing, but you would have to hold up a public meeting associated with the, with the implementation of our emergency rates. So this would be in your back pocket in case if it's needed. Um, next thing, um, last is for the board's considerations uh, to evaluate this um, rates and then to be implemented in March 1st if the board decides to adopt them. Um, I don't know if the board has any questions for me um, at this moment. I, I do have just a couple of quick points of <coughs> clarification. I included some recommendations in the memo. Um, as Sanjay's pointed out, um, we have established our current customer consumption as kind of the baseline for this study. We, the board can enact a water shortage emergency without having to enact water shortage rates. In the past, we enacted water shortage rates because of the um, huge decrease in consumption that we were seeing as a result of the drought emergency and the impact that that was having on our fin financial sustainability. Um, typically, emergency rates are enacted either when we incur significantly increased costs as a result of having a, as a result of some water emergency where we need to bring our customers water use down and we have to engage in a lot of additional conservation measures that weren't planned for under the existing rates or if we run into a situation where like we did during the drought customer consumption dropped so low that the rates that we had in place weren't able to financially sustain the district with that lower consumption. So that's typically when you see a situation where emergency rates are enacted. Um, what we're recommending at this point in time is that the board go ahead and enact base rates and drop us out of stage three emergency rates. The other consideration that I've put into um, <coughs> the recommendations in this memo is in the past the board has um, adopted a rate structure and then every year uh, at the 1st of January, we enact the rate increase. What we'd like to do under this new structure would be to go ahead and have a, um, have a board memo drafted and brought to the board for consideration so that we can kind of evaluate our financial position each year and you guys can make a decision as to whether or not you feel we need to enact a full rate structure uh, adjustment or if we can do something less than that. Let me, we have done before. Yes. Yeah. Anything else? I, yeah, I just wanted to reframe what Leslie just said to paint it one more time because this was a question asked by somebody at a meeting I was at. I thought it was a good question. So the rates that are being you know, we're in a stage three emergency right now, and rightfully so because of the seawater intrusion and the new detection of the, right along the coast. However, what the rates, and, and we're charging uh, stage three, but the rates that you have proposed tonight uh, enable you to continue with stage three emergency, but not have to charge stage three rate, emergency rates. So the current, the proposed rates will cover the emergency situation and, and everything that needs to be done to get us out of it. Just want to be clear. Okay. Any questions from board? Okay. Sanjay, the group. For now, I think we'll thank you very much. Um, comes your so, cards. pardon? Comes your card. Yeah, and I'll just say we got 16 cards. Okay. And I think w one was noted as not a customer. So, okay. 
has everybody who would like to speak on this item tonight provided a, a comment card? If you haven't, we'd be happy to pass some more around. Okay, so before we open the public hearing, I just wanna make a couple of notes. Um, all of us are customers as well, and I'm sure we would rather not have a rate increase, but we're all here and committed because we're committed to making the water supply good for the people that are here long after you know we're gone. Um, so, you know, we're just trying to do our best. And so, as we we want we want to hear your story, we want to hear what you have to say, and we will listen attentively. And I'm just going to ask also that you listen to others and um, and also be respectful in your presentation and try and understand what people are saying. Okay. Um, so we will, um, I have cards for everyone, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll call the person out and I'll also give them the name of the next person so that they can be on deck, so to speak, so we don't, um, so if we have 16 cards, I mean, that's, I think we can stick with our three minute limit, um, not go lower than that, so I want you to have an opportunity. Um, so the first speaker then would be um, Michael Boyd and then Thomas Stumba would be after him. Hello, my name's Michael Boyd and I live at 5439 SoCal Drive and I'm a customer there. Um, I uh, filed a protest against the service rate and the service charges. Um, basically, I'm, I'm happy about some of this stuff. I'm happy to see you guys are going for the recycled water and I, I don't see the word. Um, desal anywhere that makes me happy <laughs> um i'm a disappointed i feel disappointed that you're continuing to pursue the tiered rates i uh contend that is unconstitutional under prop 218 you guys seem to know it um the basic premise is the, at least what i observe is this the service you provide has to be used and usable. And what that means is you have to be able to sh show that it somehow provides an actual measurable service. And the cost has to be measurable too. And you have to compare the cost to the, how m the use of the service. For example, conservation, which I can't really see where the mo how much money you're putting in conservation. Um, that's used, but it's not really usable because you don't get any water. So how do you measure something that you're not using? So the the issue it, to me in the tiered rate making is it's penalizing the single family residents that are families, big families. And it's basically discriminating against big families. And it's discriminating them, for example, in, 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 in comparison to the multifamily residences in both the service rate and the service charge. And listening to what your, your folks were talking about, it seems clear from your own analysis that that's the case. And the way to address that, I believe, is to have a unified rate. You guys looked at it, and all I heard really from you is the bad side effect is the people that conserve, it actually costs them a little more than it should. But that goes back to conservation. Conservation doesn't give you usable water. It's just the opposite. And now we have conservation, you have other agencies that are set up to deal with that. It doesn't mean we shouldn't charge customers for conservation, but it's not something you charge through rates. There's other ways to charge for that. And people can voluntarily pay for stuff, you know. People, I, I used to use a lot more water than I did, but then I stopped watering my lawn. And now my rates Thank are you. low. But Thank if you. when they were not, okay, I'm done, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, we don't have the lights giving a warning, but. Um, 
I think At least they I can't see, see them. them. All right, so they don't. next will be next will be Mr. Stumba, followed by uh, Monica McGuire. I reset this thing. I'll repeat. Thomas Stumba, a resident of Aptos and a customer. To quote Elizabeth Warren, the, Eliz the influence of money is everywhere in politics. You folks have informed us that you need more money, lots of it. But your flyer fails to tell us outright the reason why you want so much. In, in the notice, the need to develop a supplemental water supply is mentioned directly or indirectly nine times. But nowhere do you say that what you are talking about is pure water SoCal project. They plan to treat sewage water and inject it into the aquifer. You have already spent a ton of money on this project and you wish to, your wish is to complete it at a cost of millions of dollars more. You ought not to be allowed to contaminate the aquifer with sewer water, treated or not. We don't own it and, you are, and we are not the only ones who use it. We don't need another Flint, Michigan here. Amen. Okay, please, if you could keep that down, thank you. It is not needed, as there is evidence of the availability of plenty of water without it. It is difficult to understand why you cling so tenaciously to this unnecessary project. Please hang it up, or at least put it on hold until it is proven to be necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next is Monica McGuire, and then after her will be Paul Ellerick. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. I'm Monica McGuire. I've had a business here in uh, this district for a number of years. I was a resident. I have been an expert on hydration and a health care provider for a long time, and I know you've heard from us, from me coming to these meetings for a full year, that any amount of mistakes um, in the process that you are pushing for, instead of looking at the cheaper, safer, alternative water transfers, is something that is an unnecessary risk, and we do not understand why, after a year of many of us coming and asking questions, we get specious responses and non-responses, as well as repeatedly having to sit through your hour and a half of other information that tries to supplement your position on this, that you need this pure water SoCal. It is mismanagement that created the salt water intrusion problem. It is over pumping rather than going to the marriage made in heaven, my favorite analogy as to why we've asked over and over for you to go to Santa Cruz City and woo them and say we really deeply know that our aquifer needs are perfect match for you. Instead, pushing pure water SoCal on us is subjecting us to the myriad amounts of synergistic effects of the pharmaceuticals flushed down Santa Cruz toilets and into a supply that then you triple treat, no pun intended, and try to tell us is absolutely safe. Synergistic effects, as we all know, means that pharmaceuticals can combine to create new contaminants. We don't know what those new contaminants are because they've never been studied. They can't be studied. There's too much complexity there. We do know about the nitrosamines, nitrosamines, I'm sorry, I'm not sure which the word is, that is a problem. There are multiple contaminants that you cannot clean with, unfortunately, Michael, the same system that is the desalination. We are getting a desalination type plant here, but it is not capable of fully cleaning the water. That synergistic effect has been requested to be addressed over and over and over, and you have never addressed it. Instead, you tell us over and over how the idea of the tier structures is, is actually fair and safe. It is not fair. I am committed to fairness, and more importantly, I am committed to the future of this county and all the children, not just here, but whoever might live here. I am not okay with the potential dangers of going forward with a hundreds of million dollar project that we do not need right now while you have not tested fully what you could have been doing the last 30 years with the equipment in place to do a full water transfer system. 
We are sick of being ignored. And we don't need to be sick of your poor management leading to problems Thank with you. this aquifer. Thank you. Okay. And uh, I excuse have me. A number of I mean, the your forms. time is up. Thank you very much. I have much. a number of the forms to turn in because you did not create a form for people to easily okay, your time protest is up. this. Thank you, Pastor. And that's in. not right if you only have 16 time people speaking. Thank you. Forms. With Three only minutes. 16, uh, there's one that I said. Ms. McGuire, somebody get it. you're done. The next speaker is Paul Ellerich. I've been done over and over. You've never been addressed despite the Brown Act saying you are Excuse supposed me. to address us when we bring up the same issues over and over. Excuse me. I'm asking all, all, those of you to please speak respectfully. Um, we understand, but your time is up. And Mr. Ellerich is next. And after Mr. Ellerich is Ms. Marilyn Garrett. Hi, my name's Paul Ellerich. I'm an Aptos resident, and I've been an Aptos resi resident since 1972, or 1970. And I have a long history of working with Soquel Creek Water District. When we moved to Aptos, there was a, a big water tank on the hill behind the development, and there was a well up there. And within a short period of time, there was no more water. I was surprised to see a big tanker truck come up Vienna Drive about the second day we lived there to refill that tank. So the neighbors got together and decided, well, why are we doing this? We need to contact Soquel Creek Water District and become a user. And that was exactly what happened. You know, we learned to trust Soquel Creek Water District. We had, you know, we had meetings with them. The, neighbor, the neighbors did, had meetings with them. And uh, there was a vote, I believe. And we agree, agreed that we wanted to become part of the Soquel Creek Water District. Water's not cheap, water's not cheap. But you know what, we've had good, clean water ever since. And we're looking forward to having that continue. Uh, I don't know why we're, you know, arguing about what you know what what's going to happen in the future we, we know what happened in 2015 when we didn't have any water and that could happen again and it's sort of you know it's sort of a, a hard sell right now that that you know we've got water coming down the streets but i just want to point out I'm not, I'm not gonna even take three minutes you know we're very satisfied with soquel creek water district and i would say if we think about what happened during the last election Three candidates running for re-election were unanimously re-elected. And I think that's a vote of confidence from the users of your, of your district. And I would hope people would, you know, look at the big picture on this and support the future plans that you people have to give us water in the future. Thank you. Thank you. And then Marilyn Garrett is next. And after Ms. Garrett will be Jimmy Canizaro. <coughs> I was listening to KPFA today and they referred to a book that made me think of this district. It's called Water Wars, Privatization, Pollution, and Profit by Vanda Nashiva. There's a lot of profit making in the corporations who are part of this pure, I call it poop water, so kill. There's no way to remove all the chemicals. You just heard Monica McGuire and many pharmaceuticals in trace amounts and the synergistic effects. This is true, have severe biological effects. I've cited another book uh, a number of times, but to repeat it, the book is called Toxic Sludge is Good for You, Lies, Damn Lies, and the Public Relations Industry by John Stauber and Sheldon Rampton. And it shows somebody with a glass of water that looks pretty green. And there's some revealing quotes in there. One is, as the 20th century has been characterized by three developments of great political importance, the growth of democracy, the growth of corporate power, and the growth of corporate propaganda as a means of protecting corporate power against democracy. And one of these corporate propaganda firms, Burson Marsteller State, 
The role of our communication is to manage perceptions which motivates behavior to create business results. And I think that's what's happened here. The perception is, that's been very well manipulated, is that you can put toxic chemicals into the aquifer and call it pure, and it isn't pure. I am opposed to this project. I went to one of your workshops and saw a slide up there that sh listed, looked like about 15 different corporations who have parts in bringing this uh, pure, um, well, tertiary treated sewage water injected into the aquifer for drinking. Yeah. Thank this you, Ms. Garrett. This is not a good project. It should be halted. Thank you. Ms. Canizero will be next. Excuse me. Ms. Canizero, Mr. Canizero will be next, and then after him will be Scott Brown. Uh, Jimmy Canizero, Aptos uh, customer. Um, I don't know where to really start. I've already said some of these things at other meetings, um, but it's basically about the rates. Leslie and, is, is it Sanjay? Sanjay. Sanjay. You spent um, a lot of time explaining the rates and everything and went into how much it's going to increase, uh, five bucks and that kind of thing. But you've only, you were only talking about year one. Mm -hmm. We've got five years to go. And so when I look at this, I, I don't know why you're ignoring the, the other four years of what it's going to do to our rates. Um, the 5 eighths restricted is going to go up 85%. 5 eighths regular, which is most of us, is going to go up 59%. Boy, the one inch, it goes up to 58%, 258%. That's, that's quite a steep thing. But let's go to the proposed rates. First of all, on this rate sheet that you sent out to everybody, um, Sanjay, am I getting your yeah. name right? I'm so sorry if, I, if I'm not. But this current rate figure, a lot of people don't realize it, that that's not a base rate. That is a stage three rate of the 690. And then when you say it's gonna go down, well, now you're comparing a stage three rate going down to a four or 6.43 to a, a base rate. So that's kind of misleading on your, your sheet here. But the stage two, 497% increase, three, $34.33 increase by 2023. That's a huge jump. Um, and then I think I understood you to say that stage one or tier one is just going to be for the operations and pipes, replacing pipes and stuff. So, and that's where the majority of us are going to be paying. Well, then where's the money going to come for pure water? If there's not that many tier two users, where do you get the money to pay for that if it's not going to come out of uh, tier one? So I don't know, I was a little confused on that. Um, I think that's basically all that I have, but I also wanted to mention that I understand that this water transfer that we've got going, there was over 100 million gallons available to us since December, and we only used about 20% of it. And I'm wondering why? Why don't we use more of that's available to us? Thank you, Mr. Canizaro. Uh, after Scott Brown, after Scott Brown will be um, Mr. Maxwell. Uh, I've been a customer since uh, I was paying one dollar for a <laughs> unit, uh, so it's a, a little shocking to see uh, what lies in store. But I do want a solvent district, and I really, really want to halt seawater intrusion in its tracks. Um, I'd like to apologize uh, to the young people because 
I, I am the reason we are in this situation right now. I, 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 I've been a water user. I've been using more than the sustainable rate. And uh, uh, what I'm hoping is these rates will uh, get us down to the sustainable rate. Uh, but it, it is counting on a bit of things to happen. And uh, I, I realize we might have to do something else in the future, but that, that is our most important thing to do and, and to develop um, uh, other resources, uh, uh, of course. Um, uh, I, I've heard some people talk about uh, uh, pure water soquel. Uh, uh, on the surface of it, I, I, I generally support it. It, it seems like a, a good way to, to reuse water. And the, uh, the, the, the drug issue is, is a very serious issue. Uh, when my uh, dad died in uh, Oregon a few years ago, I asked the hospice nurse, what should we do with the uh, leftover medicines? And she said, flush them down the toilet. And um, uh, even then, I knew that wasn't right. And uh, we did a little research and uh, made a mash and uh, just put it in, in the garbage. So uh, b before the, the pure water it gets closer. There just needs to be a public education campaign, and I think most people would be receptive to doing some, uh, you know, drug pickup and, and, and not just flushing it down the toilet. And so, uh, hopefully, the, the only drug thing would be what is left over after our bodies metabolize the drugs. Um, anyway, uh, I'll leave after with a minute to go. Have a good night. <laughs> Thank you. Um, after Mr. Maxwell is um, Becky Steinbrenner. It's Colonel Maxwell, and I'm a rate payer. And I've watched this committee, this board of supervisors, this board of directors for years now. And I've watched the performance or failure of performance of the Soquel Creek Water District. I've watched you guys waste part of $17 million on a desal project study that was influenced by Mr. Coker or Corker, the former Santa Cruz City Water Director, whose son-in-law is Mr. Dufour. Interestingly enough, speaking of conflicts of interest, and Mr. Corker retired early because he was caught taking money from the people who wanted to sell $300 million worth of desal plant unnecessary to this county and these two, this district and the city of Santa Cruz. And speaking of the corporate corruption that, Ms., uh, that Marilyn referred to, and speaking of the 1,000% accurate comments made by Monica McGuire, fundamentally, you guys have failed. I helped two of you get elected. I regret it. You have failed your sworn duties. You have failed to ethically behave. You have failed to look after the money and resources of the 15,800 customers here. And you're proposing 50 to $100 million in debt uh, to be shared by 15,000 water district customers. And you're proposing this as a consequence of how did we get here? We got here, as Monica referenced, 30 years of negligence by the board of directors, your incumbents and some of you sitting here and your prior members. And Mr. Kriege, the very corrupt former director here, and I don't say things I haven't gotten boxes of evidence to support. He pushed us into this ignoring studies worn by Stanford professors and others that we were going to deplete the groundwater, we were going to deplete the aquifers. But it was ignored and pushed aside, and they hired phony studies, some of the former directors sitting up here, and Mr. Kriege, and we end up with depleting the water. And we end up with SoCal Village being approved by the directors here against the, ex the recommendations of anybody with half a brain. And we, rec we also find out that the studies that Mr. Dufour said, oh, we should, we, we've offset the water for SoCal Village. Not at all. Total damn fraud. Like so much of the decision making up here. I'd rather be able to compliment you. I can't. I've watched the evidence. It is tragic. And this is not, should not be called SoCal pure water. It should be called SoCal poop water. And it is unsafe. And there is an alternative, which I've seen for seven years presented here. And that's the Lockerfer study of Jerry Paul, engineer Jerry Paul. But you've ignored it and your predecessors. The city has ignored it. The time has come for a regional takeover by the state of the water resources of this region because none of you nor your staff can be trusted to be competent and honest at looking at the resources here. You have been so profligate with the re water resources of this, of this region and district. You should all be removed for incompetence and apparent corruption and complicity. The next speaker will be Becky Steinbrenner. <laughs> um, followed by uh, Art Alfaro. 
Thank you, Becky Steinbruner. I'm a resident of Aptos and a customer of Pure Source Water that does have a, an emergency intertie connection with the district. I think that all of the customers should give a, a huge thanks to customer John Cole, who did his own proper legal work, and that's why you had to change your tier structure, because he went to court after you brushed him aside, and the judge ruled that it is, it was in illegal to do what you were doing. I want to ask you to not approve these rate structures that are based solely to fund Pure Water SoCal, which was not at all clearly addressed in any of the information you put out to your uh, rate payers, but you have ver been very free to announce tonight. I have filed legal action against the um, many environmental action, environmental impact report violations for the Pure Water SoCal and um, until the, that case is heard, I do not think you should support approving a rate base that is structured solely to support that project. I think that the um, increase of two and a half million dollars to annual operating costs that this project would bring is irresponsible. When there are other systems and water sources available that you are not willing to evaluate evaluate and that is part of why I'm bringing action against your district because you did not evaluate them as a no project alternative for the Pure Water SoCal project. I want to thank Mr. Cole for again pointing out to you that your rate, inc your rate structuring again penalizes, as Mr. Boyd said, the single f family residences with more than just a couple of people in them. That is unfair and does not support the spirit of Proposition 218. I want to point out that you can get grants to help Santa Cruz City work to improve their infrastructure so that the surface water transfers could occur at a larger amount, a larger volume. You can get grants for those things. So don't tell me that there are no grants available for surface water transfers. I want to say that Mr. Canizero has rightly pointed out to you that you have been in stage three emergency rates for many years. And in my hearing your f uh, previous discussions, stage three was supposed to be based on water conditions, hydrological conditions, not on financial situations. And that is exactly what you're doing here. I think it's illegal. I want to say that your $70 million grants that you're hoping to get for Pure Water SoCal are uh, reimbursement grants, and you cannot expect to get those reimbursements for eight to 10 years. I've heard that said here. So you moved up your project. Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Project Next completion will be date Mr. to Art 2022, me. just to get the money. Time is up. And I want to note that Mr. Ellerick, the father-in-law of Dr. Jaffe, did not have the clock turned on. No, until he, he was he, nearly he done. He was under three minutes. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, because it didn't turn on. <laughs> I kept track of the time. <laughs> so, Mr. Alfaro, and then following Mr. Alfaro will be Chris Keyes. Hi, my name is Art Alfaro. I'm a resident of uh, Seacliff Mobile Home Park at uh, 2700 uh, Mar Vista Drive. Uh, we're an over, we're uh, over 55 senior park there. We have about 150 uh, uh, residents there, and uh, we have 101 homes. And we don't like change. You know, the only time we come out is when there's a proposed change. And we've been working very closely with Roy Sykes. You know, we love him because, you know, we've been doing an excellent job of uh, conserving water. I think we've done too good of a job to conserving water. Uh, one of the things that uh, we work very closely is we self-manage our park. So we don't want to go out and spend $150,000 to get a property management company. So we run ourselves. We take care of ourselves. And we've been doing that very well. And we've been working without a budget, and then we go over our budget every November to what's going to be for the next year. We always uh, call uh, Roy or the water district, hey, what's going to be your rate for the next year so we can budget it in there? Last year, we budgeted $35,000. Uh, uh, our, uh, our actual was $34,710. So this year, when we were budgeting for 2019, uh, you guys sat your meet with uh, your staff for coffee. We met with your staff. We met with V uh, at Pacific Roasters and everything. We said, what are going to be your increases for 2019 so that way we can put that in our budget? She says, well, this year I really don't know. So uh, we said, you really don't know? She says, no, we won't know until January. So being what we've had in the past, like in uh, 
on May 23rd, 2017, or in 2017, the state legislature approved uh, for all garbage companies a 20% increase. Uh, they passed it without public notice or voters' approval. Then on May 23rd, 2017, the Santa Cruz County Supervisors approved a new franchise agreement with Green Waste uh, for county residents and businesses. Uh, they approved a uh, 10 to 15% increase for 2018. We just got another hit with another 10 to 15 percent increase for uh, 2019, and there's going to be another 10 to 11 percent increase in uh, on June 30th of 2020. So in the last few years, just for uh, garbage, that's over 50 percent uh, increase. So we said, okay, what's SoCal Creek going to do? Okay, well let's our more our conservatives. We can control our water usage. Okay, we're not too worried about the rate. We're protesting the uh, fixed rate. Okay, that, that we have no control over. Okay, we said, okay, it's 490, it was 437 the year before. Okay, let's, it seems like it's gonna go up a little bit. Okay, let's be aggressive. Let's up it 40%. So we increased it from 490 to 690. So when the rates came out, you can see how when we saw the increase from 490 to $1,557, that's a 200% increase. I mean, for seniors that have been, you know, uh, watching their pennies, we, you know, they, what did we receive? A 2.8, uh, thank you, CPI, but thank you. So hopefully we work to get from a, a four inch to a two inch. So we're working with your staff. Hopefully we can continue that. Thank you. Um, so after Mr. Keys, um, would be Terry Thomas. Hello, Chris Keys, uh, resident of Aptos since 1964 grew up with Jim Canizaro. You know, I, what Ron said, I think, it, I, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I believe in keeping up infrastructure. Absolutely, we see it throughout the state. It's not being kept up. You know, when we were growing up, they're building roads all over. So we need to do that, but how far do we go? Obviously, the pipes need to be replaced, but um, a lot of the folks that I grew up with live here, and now we're seniors, you know? Hard to believe, but it's true. <laughs> and, you know, most of us where I live are on Social Security fixed income. And this rate jump for our area to go up 218% is out of line. Ron showed the nice graph, nice and steady for the, uh, the blue line. That's a red line. When we're going from $490 to 1557 that's 218 percent. And also down the road, was it four or five years, um, it's going to be uh, amount to 349 percent. And you, you ought to reconsider that. I appreciate Sanjay's work and um, all his figures and presentation. But it seems to be a bit, like other people have said, a bit of a smoke screen. So I would urge you to reconsider the rates that were currently $490. And why jump to seniors? Are we gonna get a 218% increase in Social Security? <laughs> Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Keyes. So next is, so Terry Thomas and then Charles Thomas after that. Uh, we're, we're together. Okay. So I'm gonna just keep reading. We have an acre of land. So we went to a citizen workshop on the proposed water rate hikes February 12th at the Aptos lab Library on a fact-finding mission. The situ we found that the situation um, showed us well-researched graphics and saying that the board does not seem interested in pursuing the completion of the water transfer pilot project with Santa Cruz before embarking on a $90 million plus pure water SoCal plan, which was approved in December when everybody was busy. Why is that? The only explanation I read was that Santa Cruz might potentially charge more for the water. Is that all? Well, that would mean that they also might potentially charge more for treated wastewater you want them to send our way instead. Water that will require further treatment 
at this expensive plant upgrade you want us to pay for with rate hikes. And that isn't even saying that the finished product will be free of contaminants. Bottom line for us is unless you can guarantee that any water you inject into our aquifer is totally pure, then you shouldn't even be considering doing it. Right. Once you contaminate our aquifer, there's no going back or fixing it. Then the value of all life and property around this area goes down to nothing, kind of like Flint, Michigan. We don't understand why you're not willing to continue to pursue the transfer of runoff um, and excess water through the existing pipes from Santa Cruz, of which there seems to be plenty, instead of embarking on this highly expensive and not so clean treated water alternative. We haven't heard any discussion regarding efforts to petition the state to allow you to draw water from our area creeks either. What action have you taken to change the state rules governing water use restrictions in our district? Who at the state level have you contacted about this? What was their response? What about adding more retention ponds or seeing if we can pump water from the aquifer to the east near Coralitas, a barely tapped resource? We have been in stage three emergency water rationing since June of 2015. There's no reason for us to believe that this designation will change with this new proposal. Correct me if I'm wrong. The cost to us ratepayers will be prohibitive. A bill for 12 units in July of 2018 was 181. Next July, it will be $324, and in 2023, the cost will be $458, average of 250% more. Also, you want to impose penalties on high water users. Define high. Plus, you plan to charge more if we use less. A Sentinel article dated February 8th states, and I quote, the church, Twin Lakes, could receive a portion of incoming treated water for irrigation, not for drinking. Thank you. Because that's my one. Well, the next person will come, so that'll He's, be Charles Thomas. That's, I'm speaking for him. No, you're not. No, it has to be a different person, yeah, sorry. Okay, well, he can read the rest, okay, right. so start here. Okay, Charles, I'm with her, <laughs> weird to know that. Mm -hmm. Just start at the top. Give me another five minutes, will you? No. <laughs> So, okay, so the Sentinel article, the Sentinel article uh, February 8th states that church, the church, Twin Lakes, could receive portion of incoming treated water for irrigation, not for drinking. If you can't drink it, you shouldn't allow it to be pumped into the aquifer. Also, my understanding is that the saltwater intrusion is occurring mostly in the Selva Beach area. What good will the pumping treated water into the aquifer at Twin Lakes do for them? Experts say that it takes about 100 years for water to percolate down into the aquifer. So why this rush to approve this pure water SoCal so many objections and with so many objections and concerns? We were given 218 notice in January, six weeks before the public hearing on it. Certainly not enough time for anyone to mobilize 50 plus, 50% 50 plus one ratepayer to protest the hike. Who made up that rule? What about demanding the rule where 50% plus one ratepayer should have to be able to approve the hike of the pure water and the pure water so pro proposal? What you should do is send out a ballot so everyone affected can vote whether to support this project or the, or the water transfer option with a clear explanation of both. That would be fair. What I also learned at the meeting uh, was that several concerned residents come to the meetings and to your meetings and claim that they are ignored not allowed to speak and or when they do that is uh, it's not mentioned in the minutes three public comments were heard the last one well what were those comments what were your responses minutes are supposed to reflect what has transpired at a meeting yeah. these people seemed well informed thoughtful and concerned on November 6th, the minutes state five public comments were heard regarding concerns on cost and services, supplemental supplies, future district costs, water transfers. One favorable comment on the reasonableness of the rate plan was elaborated on. None of the others were. It would appear that you are in, interested in and with anyone who would be willing to support your, your attitude and your, your feelings. This is truly a shame as we believe the points of view are legitimate and have value to be addressed, especially the one urging you to, com to complete the water transfer pilot project with Santa Cruz.
before saddling us with pure water so kill. The race hike goes on and on. Thank you. And I have 16 seconds. I think if you guys, if you guys pollute our aquifers, I think maybe legally, you could be legally bound and uh, criminal charges. I would hope so if you screw things up like that. Okay, that's enough. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't mention the next speaker. The next speaker is Gary Lindstrom, and then after Mr. Lindstrom is Richard Andre. Hi, my name is Gary Lindstrom, resident of Aptos. Um, I think it's time that this board start dealing with reality. This rate increase, it, <clears throat> these rate increases are not needed because the semi-pure water Soquel project is not necessary at this time. The water transfer system is up and running and it deserves your undivided attention to promote and expand the system at a significantly lower cost than the semi-pure water project. <laughs> Prop 218 or not, these increases are not needed at this time because pure water Soquel is not needed at this time. Water is one of the three necessities of life. They are food, air, and water. It should not be used as or seen as a commodity on the stock market. It is a necessity of life and should be offered to customers at the least possible cost. Shame on this board and others in the district office for pricing residents out of our area because that is what you will be doing if these rate increases are passed. People are living on the edge right now. The economy is not good and you start forcing these people that have lived here for a long time out of our area, then you lose the character of your community and you've done them harm. There's no reason why they should be forced out of this area simply because of water rates. Uh, if you are willing to drop stage three, uh, as you mentioned a little earlier, um, then rates need to be recalculated because from my understanding, these new rates are based on the stage three level. So if it is, then that whole thing needs to be redone. Um, I, re I really truly hope that you guys will sit down and use some common sense and get behind the transfer system. It is workable, it's doable, it is very affordable compared to semi-pure water Soquel. And uh, I just think that you, start, you need to start listening to the ratepayers, the well owners, and the residents of this community. Everyone has a straw in that aquifer. And it is your responsibility to make sure that nothing happens to it and that it is refilled as quickly as possible. We've proven to you that the transfer system can work, but you just won't get behind it and push it. Put your project on hold for two years and let this go forward. Thank you. Um, Mr. So I had a card for Richard Andre. Richard Andre and then after Mr. Andre is John Dickinson. Uh, Richard Andre, I'm a customer for less than 40 years. I apologize, <laughs> but a lot of water and we raise a big garden. We try to. The deer are our main enemy, but the water district's close right now. <laughs> uh, to, to board and staff, we appreciate uh, you know all, all you do, a lot of the information you gave us. Frankly, uh, we we don't really think we need, but the collective rains experience and abilities here are good, even if you screw up a little bit sometimes. And well, however. Uh, we have praise, we thank you for service, but there are faults that exist. Uh, let me get this straight, first of all. You want to pollute my water supply with treated sewage water and then charge me more for the polluted water I use. <laughs> I think that's a stinking bad deal. <laughs> uh, 
there are some, I can't cite them, I'm sorry, but there are some cases of uh, systems that have been declared safe in the past. And then 10, 20, 30 years later, oh, we made a mistake. I predict that's what would happen with your impure or poop water uh, program. Uh, I'm going to take one detour right now to the board uh, and to the chairman. I respect what he's trying to do. He's trying to keep us under control. Uh, I taught uh, law of the press for four years, and I've been involved in about four major, well, at least they were, seemed major at the time to me, Brown Act disputes. And one of the questions that was asked is, is there any problem with an audience getting enthusiastic or a little bit raucous about the speakers? No. It's when they get up and they insult uh, and threaten the board or something like that, that's when they're out of control. So if we're a little raucous, or some of us are, for some of these speakers, it's okay. Uh, now as to your, uh, well, let's forget pure water. It's an impure. Uh, water transfers, please whatever the difficulties, uh, and apparently there are some problems getting it done, but with all of your brains and your ability, you don't want to be like a lot of board members are of a lot of boards. They know a lot of technical facts, they know a lot of information, it's supplied by staff members like these, but sometimes they sort of get blinders and they don't look at other opportunities. Maybe you need a minority board member to go out and really pursue that or woo, as the word was used here a while ago. Uh, and as to more customers being added and added and added, uh, there is a formula. Thank you, Mr. Andre. Kiss them off. Thank you. And then Mr. Dickinson. My name is John Dickinson. I live in SoCal. And to... Uh, quote one of the all-time great movie lines, I'm goddamn mad I'm not going to take it anymore. <laughs> so what I'm mad about is that most of my life I've paid water bills. And most of my life I have not paid enough for water. Water is the most precious commodity besides air we have. But we very, very gladly pay a lot more for other commodities like gasoline, wine, whiskey, perfume, Coca-Cola, or Pepsi-Cola. Mm -hmm. Please don't interrupt the speakers. No, you can interrupt, it's fine. Because the truth is that most people don't quite understand that if we don't charge enough for water, we won't have any water. I worked on the pure, on the, um, not the pure water project, I did work on Customer Select. I helped develop that model. The real point of Customer Select was to create a fair rate system that would enable the district to move forward, well, with pure water, I suppose, or with water transfer, or with whatever, with some other system, because we do not have a sustainable aquifer. I ran into, at a social event on Saturday night, the, the Monterey County man in charge of drinking water quality in Monterey County. Well, all by itself, that aquifer is shot. First of all, they've got seawater incursion. And second of all, I walk into the bathroom at the church we were at, and there's a sign on the mirror that says, don't drink this water. The arsenic levels are too high. That could happen here without anybody doing anything. And anybody who thinks that the water coming down the San Lorenzo is pure is full of something else pure. <laughs> and it's not water because that water has to be purified as well. It has to be treated, it has to be cleansed, it has to be detoxified. It's not like it's so damn cheap. There is no such thing as putting our aquifer on a, a safe footing that's not gonna cost money. It's just not, there is no such thing. The infrastructure required to do any of this stuff is expensive. The chemistry required to do it is expensive to develop and implement. It doesn't matter, no matter how we do this, if we're gonna have sustainable water in Santa Cruz, in, in this district, in Santa Cruz County in general, 
we're going to have to spend some money, and to do that, we need to raise rates, period. So I'm goddamn mad, and I'm not going to take it anymore. Thanks. Thank you. All right, um, I have that, that takes care of all the people who have submitted cards. Um, is there anyone that we missed? Okay, then um, I'm going to close the public hearing. Wait, before you do that, ask if there's any more protests, please. Sorry, are there any more protest letters? Th this is the last time anybody can submit a protest. Even though no forms were given. And, uh, okay, so. I said this is the last time anybody can submit a written protest. Are there any more? Oh, okay. Thank you. I don't need your interview. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. No. no. Only Customer. customers. All right, so um, it's been moved and seconded to close the public hearing. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so motion, that's th done with the public hearing. I wanted to make a couple of comments and I'm gonna ask the staff to, re um, so one of the things that people keep bringing up, multiple people keep bringing up is why don't we just do the water transfer, which is a water transfer from the city of Santa Cruz. And just, just once again, I made this clear at the last meeting, but I wanna make clear again. W this Board is President? from this, I, I realize if that's the letter, I think you're gonna read. It's actually in the minutes. Would you like me to pull it up from the last meeting? It's okay. I mean, I yeah, sure. But I'll read it while you're finding that. Um, so I just because we keep hearing this, and obviously, if we had cheaper water, um, we would go for it. But this is from the director of the Santa Cruz Water Department, Rosemary Menard. And I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but if the the main points here that relate to what you're asking or talking about is I did not say that we would expect to have more water available to transfer. In fact, I said just the opposite. I said that there is not enough surface water to reliably meet both the city of Santa Cruz's needs and the needs of SoCal Creek um, to protect the aquifer from, from seawater intrusion. I don't recall saying anything at all about the city water being less expensive than the Pure Water SoCal project. If, it, if I did mention cost, under no circumstances would I have said that transfer water would be cheaper than pure water SoCal because, in fact, I don't believe that would be the case. And I particularly don't believe that would be the case if SoCal gets the $50 million grant it is applying for. So there are a couple of points. This is the, the department we would have to get the water from. They own the water. They own the water, and that is their statement. And I just wanted to get that clear. The other thing is, um, a couple other mentioned um, contamination of the of the groundwater. So uh, that is super important to all of us. We've gone through a lot of time and looking at, at actually scientific data for the water that's been produced from this exact type of project, such as the one that's been used in Orange County for over 40 years. And the real risk is contamination, I agree, but it's contamination by seawater. So. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask, maybe staff could address, that several people from the mobile home park mentioned the idea about helping them with their meters. So I just wondered if you had any uh, thoughts on that. We actually do have, um, Taj DeFleur has reached out and is speaking with members of the uh, mobile home park HOA and evaluating what options might be available to them. Okay, see if we could have smaller meters. Yeah, they currently run a fire service through that meter, I believe. Okay. So there are some options there for are, them. There are okay. some options, but there are some things that would have to probably be changed as well. And if you could, Ron, if you could just clarify the stage three question. Yeah, so, okay. So we are currently in stage three, have been for about five years, roughly, right, Leslie? Mm -hmm. And that was due to a number of things. One, we had, uh, declared the state declared drought so revenue dropped by about 25 percent two we had seawater intrusion at our along the coast and the board wasn't exactly sure how close it was now we know it's right at the coast so it was probably very prudent to, to declare that at the time and so we've been that's kind of become your your base rate it's been you've paid that for five years and what this proposed rate does is encapsulate that the cost in the proposed rates uh, allow us to continue 
with the lower water usage, maybe some increase, uh, and also keep doing the things we've been doing, all the conservation efforts and whatnot to, that you would normally do in a state, that you do in a stage three, because there's a whole host of things as in our urban, urban water management plan. The net result is that the proposed rates allow the district board, if they wish, to move forward with all the actions of stage three curtailment but not, in, not impose stage three costs on top of that. Okay, thank you. And then questions from, or statements from board, you, you had something you wanted to say? I don't wanna pay more money. Nobody does, but the alternative is to do nothing and pollute the aquifer. So I take to heart the, the comments, especially with building the relationship with Santa Cruz because it makes sense to work with your neighbors to solve problems. And I've met personally with four council members to discuss the problem and to see how we can work together. And I'll continue to meet with them and others who want to uh, solve the problem. And the problem is seawater intrusion. And um, I'm open and I think all the directors and the district are open to receiving as much river water as the city will give us. Um, and right now, the agreement is for um, 300 acre feet, and it lasts for um, another year plus. And of course, we're gonna pursue getting more water from them. So we're not so far apart. We are, um, trying to solve a problem, and it costs money. I wish it didn't, but it does. Bruce? Uh, a few things. Uh, first of all, I want to apologize for the extremely weird and, and difficult process that this has to, that, to satisfy your op opposition to these rates. So would everyone who voted for Prop 218 stand up, and we can take a, you know, a pot, pot shot at you, because basically it comes from 218 that the citizens of California voted for. So some of you out there voted for it, so it's your fault, and, and ours too, everyone who voted for it made this process happen. You don't have to treat us this way. It's, it, the, the point is that it, the point is we have no choice. We have to do it this way, because the two, hey, the, excuse me, the, the, the period for our hearing is o is over, so there's no more. There's okay, thank you. So 218 requires us to do it this way. I agree, it's stupid and it's offensive and it's pon ponderous and it's difficult to do, but that's what we're required to do by the state. Most people didn't know. Okay, excuse me. Now let me talk about. I mean, I think you you've already heard this comment from the director of the water district in Santa Cruz, the one who would supply us and charge us. In fact, she's charging us already. We're paying $300 an acre foot for the water we're getting from Santa Cruz, which is double the cost of what we pay to pump it out of the ground. So already we're paying a little penalty because of that. And Prop 218, and we're doing that right now. So we're, we're bringing their water over right now, and we have been since early December. So we're doing it right now to test to make sure it works. But that cost only applies for this year and next year. And in fact, they've already been sued by some of their customers because Prop 218, as you've heard, says you can't charge one person $5 and another person $10 for the same thing. And we're getting water a lot cheaper than their customers are paying right now. In fact, some of the North Coast users have sued the city over that fact that they're getting paid, they're, they're paying more than we're paying. And so that can't continue. Clearly that can't continue. So we would have to pay the same price that the, in fact, what we'd have to pay, you know, from those bar graphs, there was an inside the city and outside the city rates. And outside the city rates was higher than our current, our new rates. And that's the rate we would have to pay for the water is outside the city, because clearly we're outside the city. And otherwise you'd be violating Prop 218 and any customer in the city could sue the city and they would win. Because clearly, Cl okay. Clearly, they would Excuse pay me. more. Do you want um, to be? Uh, let's. Uh, Do we want to call, please be respectful. We, we may have to remove you from the room. Excuse me, but. And you too. If if the public comment period is done, can you please be respectful of the public process? And 
certain people will have to be leave the room if that's if they so don't anyone can't be respectful. Anyone who's telling you that the water is going to be a lot cheaper is is either deluded or lying to you because that's clearly not Kay. the case. Did someone else did someone else have some Carla, did you have something to say? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I came on the board Kay. just as uh, microphone. I came on the board just as the stage three emergency. We declared that that was uh, I actually favored a more I I saw a more severe emergency than stage three because the we would just finished talking about the threat of seawater intrusion and once you know Mr. Ellerick referred to trucking water to fill up a water tank because of the fa a failed well their failed failed well it that's what we could do we could truck water from they have a pure water project over in Santa Clara County. We could get what they, they'll have plenty of water. We could truck that if we do not do anything. We are facing some severe issues. And the city of Santa Cruz does not, has told us, and it clearly stated it to us that we, we will not be, there will not be enough water for us to, to rely on that project. The Pure Water SoCal project could, ironically enough, make it possible for the water transfers to succeed because it wouldn't be have to be a reliable consistent supply we would have one as a baseline but that is not what this this whole uh meeting is about this is about the rates to do this and more than one person the the, the financial analyst mr San, uh mr sanjay uh, Gar, uh and our own finance man manager said that we have we have to plan conservatively this the rates are based on not getting any grant money if we did water transfers there would be no grant money so these rates would not change especially but in any case prop 218 forbids we'd have to do another 218 process to raise rates but not to lower rates so it's conceivable if plans go accordingly that we would be able to lower rates in response to lower costs so I I appreciate this has been a very complicated I've been working very hard on this for four over four years now and I have a faint understanding of this but I so I understand how complicated it is and I know Rosemary I just had an email uh, copy of it Scott said well how could you how could you cut off water they had to cut off water for to for, to the pilot project the water transfer because there ironically there's too much water and it spurred spawning in the the coho among the coho salmon so they cut off our water supply that we were depending on for the transfer because they had to protect the fish spawning season so uh, this water managers are practically on call at various times to respond to the needs of the environment and to the customer's needs but this is something that Can everyone should take into account and they shouldn't be yelling Colonel that Lyons. we don't it's know closed. anything we Lyons. have studied this for a while and that Very goes for you too now. colonel we're gonna get you to especially to leave voluntarily or we'll get the you know you were in you've been in these we'll meetings you know how complicated this is only because you, you have I think we just answered a bunch of those questions. Excuse me, same with you. Excuse me. Let, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> no more public hearings. We're not a public hearing. A public hearing has been made a procedure. You have oral communications still being heard. No, now, no, you don't. Uh, Michael, you don't know what you're talking about. Okay, sorry. Okay, okay, <laughs> it's on the agenda. Many of you are being very respectful. It's on items that are not on the agenda. That you already spoke on an item on the agenda. It's closed. And that three minutes is not sufficient. And if you cannot, especially when my three minutes have been ignored for a year straight at every meeting. We are. We are. Okay. They're getting them right now. You may do that. I'll leave on my own accord because it is a travesty that we are not using Please, please be respectful, sense. Monica. Recess. Come on, it's right. Come on, it's right. That's right. I did not have my time. Monica, please please be respectful of everybody's over time. Over and they were not honored the way Taj, the Brown Act asked for things to be honored. Just to Thank you. Somebody. So you are out of order and we are taking on 
And it but, probably yeah. will come down to you. Okay, I, some uh, other people would like to speak. Thank you. So I would like to talk about water quality because that has been brought up a lot. Um, as you know, we test our groundwater all the time. We, over 300 constituents I think we test for all the time. And the city of Santa Cruz tests for a lot of things all the time as well. Um, and in particular, um, there's these set of constituents called CECs, contamin con constituents of emerging, well, emerging concern. concerns, CECs. And uh, we know what's in our groundwater and most things are non-detect. There are a few things that are in the single digits. So, you know, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, kind of like that. Um, and the city's numbers are, m several of them are in the double digits. So 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. Some of the constituents are up in the three digits. So 100, 200, 300, 400. And, and you might ask, why is that? Uh, when I was on the regional board, and by the way, Tom was on the regional board too, the Regional Water Quality Control Board for the state, for our di district, uh, we put the, s the county of Santa Cruz on notice, called a total maximum daily load, for nitrate that was in the river, the San Lorenzo River. Because you go up that river, there are thousands of septic systems. And the, the many of them have been built 60, 70 years ago, are not maintained well. So every time they take a pill and flush the toilet, whatever they've taken, some of it goes into the water. And so that's where some of the nitrate comes from. And that's where all these constituents come from. So really, you know, you, if you really want pure water, safe water, secure water, you know, with nothing in it, you want the pure water project because that's, that has been treated. In fact, people from the, from the department have come in and said, you know, if you want pure water, out of, the, out of the river, you would have to put a purification project there. In fact, I would, I would say that if, if we decide to go with the transfer, I would g like to pay for a purification project because we, we're, we're getting some of those things into our water supply. They're, they're all below you know, the maximum daily load numbers, but they're too high for me. I, I would not like to drink them. Whereas everything, everything from the Orange County purification project is below detection levels, everything. And the same is true of the, the project right over the hill, Pure Water, Silicon Valley, everything is below detection levels. They're finishing up the purification project in Monterey, Pure Water Monterey. Uh, we don't have numbers for it yet, do we? Do we? Well, they have uh, been running pilot numbers. Pilots, yeah. and, you know, and everything is below detection levels. So if you want really water with no constituents, no, no pharmaceuticals, nothing, then either you put a purification project on top of what we're getting from the city's sewer system, or you put a purification project on the stuff they're pumping out of that river, which is sort of untreated sewage water. Okay. Any, any other, Michelle, do you have anything to say? I, I didn't have anything to say about all that stuff. I was gonna ask some questions about the- Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I know we got this letter from Mr. Cole and I was wondering uh, if has anybody checked his math to make sure he didn't make a mistake. I, um, I was having a hard time following that. What Mr. Cole um, has failed to understand is that the, um, the tier allocation is based on household, not on account. Okay, because that's what I thought when I was looking at it, that it looked like it was like one account so he's trying to compare seven. a single family, one household account to a multifamily, five or six household account, and not, not understanding one. or not accepting the fact that that five or six household account is serving five or six households. Okay. And so that's the tier allocation is per household. Okay, I just wanted to make sure because I was getting kind of tired reading all of this stuff mm -hmm. and trying to make sense out of it. Okay, and then my other question was, do we have an alternative, what, one of the things I didn't understand is, what is, what are the rates if we got the $50 million grant? Is that somewhere in there? I mean, I thought we would have heard something about it and had some yeah. idea. Uh, when Raftel is presented back in November, they presented under both scenarios. And right. I believe that was a 6%, 6, 6, 6, 6 all the way across the board. 6% instead of 9%. Yeah, right. because when I, when I was on this, in the sewer district, we looked at alternatives. Right. I mean, we posted one, but then we had an alternative saying, well, if, 
you don't want to do this whole 10 percent this is what the six percent or what the other option might be and if you want to go somewhere in between because we we um, posted the worst case but we don't have to accept it that's correct correct mm -hmm. Right. And the rates could be prorated based on the grant amount, so to speak. Think about it in the easily grant question. But lesson. Yeah, but but when making that determination, we'll have to review it and look at the timing of any grant right. disbursements that we might get. Well, the the grant disbursements. I mean, they don't just give you the money. You spend the money. You send them a bill. They pay you back. Right. So, um, what we're looking at here is assuming we're going to start spending the money a certain year right mm -hmm. Sanjay <laughs> and what year is that this year next year this year and that's this for year. the engineering that's for the design okay oh, yeah that's the engineering part of the design engineering acquisition okay it's all of that mm -hmm. okay and some of that's not going to be probably um, if we start the work. Do they are is that can that be still paid for with the grant or is it after a certain cutoff date? Melanie, does the grant allow us to go retro if like let's, what if for work being spent today if we get the grant in the future? So okay. no, it doesn't. So we need to look at that for this year. So okay. the, the work we've done now is on the $2 million planning grant that we secured from the state, a lot of that work. Okay. Okay. No more questions, Rochelle? No, I mean, I'm not going to repeat everything everybody else already said. Okay. So. Bruce, <laughs> she had more questions. I think the cl to clarify, I think your question was the grant money in terms of if we go forward with it or well, we get if, awarded. if we got the grant and we're moving forward with engineering it some grants will let you like as of the day of the grant program recoup your money and others don't or they'll say um, the money that you already spent can count towards your match yes but so both so um, anything after November 4th, 2014 is considered eligible for a match. And then what is awarded, say, if we were um, to receive grant money, especially for like the implementation grant, it would be when the grant was awarded and then going forward. The State Water Resources Control Board's uh, reimbursement from what we've learned from the past uh, feasibility study grant and, and now as we're going forward with the planning grant, once you invoice within three to six months, they should be giving um, a reimbursement check for that, what you're invoicing for. There is, I think, a different type of reimbursement program for federal um, that, that could take a while. And then because of the Title 16 program where you um, typically apply for, you can get up to $20 million, but you may be applying for that in several years or, ch or chunks, that could take more years. But from the um, Prop 1, I think the invoicing is going to be a lot faster for a reimbursement to come through. Okay. Can I ask a couple other questions to you? I think that the Prop 1 grant that we were invited to submit for the deadline was yesterday, the 18th. Did we indeed submit that? The state awarded um, uh, an extension to all of those who are applying for round two, and so that goes on March 4th. March 4th. Okay. So soon anyway. And I think you've heard from staff some things that they're trying to accelerate the award process. So they're talking about maybe spring to award the grants? Yes. Okay. They are trying to get out a, another round mm -hmm. of funding, and they can't issue out that next round until Til they the first one's award done. the second yeah. round. So it means that as early as, say, June, we could start considering reducing the, these increases because th we might have gotten the, the uh, grants then. I th we're hopeful that the uh, the announcements of awardees would come then and think it would be, a, if, if awarded mm -hmm. for the district, it would be when the board felt they would want to do that because the grant right. agreement could take a couple months to. To work out, right, yes. But still, it means like this year, we would perhaps know that we've got it and could then consider reducing the rates so that many of these rates in the future that people are talking about may never happen as such. That is a, a hopeful situation okay. if we're awarded the right. grant. Right. I have one question of you. Uh, we've been talking a lot about the various supplemental supplies, the, namely the two that we're currently considering. 
but I think also we con considered what happened if we can't get any supplemental supply, and I think you ran some numbers about what we might have to do with the rate increase if we don't get any supplemental supplies. And you have a ballpark of what that would might be? I, I know that um, we did an in-house analysis of right. what it would be with no project, and that would mean that we would need to reduce customer water use to the 2,300 acre feet a year right. um, sustainable pre-recovery pumping goal. And that meant, um, I, I believe it was like a 55% increase in rates in year one. So instead of a 9% increase, it would be a 55% increase. Right. And less water. Yes. That's and, not too as palatable, we were, is it? If, that's, if we were to not do a project and have to reduce And of course, we, could get, we could get no grants for that. I mean, it's like if you can get a loan for a car because they can repossess the car. You can't get a, a loan for buying food for your children because they can't repossess, repossess that. So it's very similar to that, that if we pay money to somebody for something that we get back, we get no grants. But if we build something, then we can get a grant for that. Correct. Okay. So there was some comments that I heard about the emergency rates. So, and Becky correctly pointed out that that's the, whether there, there's an emergency or not a, is based upon cumulative rainfall over a number of years. That's one criteria. There's, there's yeah. several others. Yeah. And um, so that process is in my recollection is in the spring is when we determine that right uh march uh shelly could address that but it's in the spring we we that's wait for the enough, yeah. yeah yeah so i'll go on record that um i support the staff recommendation of not having emergency rates and the reason for that is that we have a direction now where i can see recovery of the basin in a uh time frame that I think is fast enough to um, keep the uh, seawater where it should be out in the ocean so that but that's premature I, I want to see what happens between now and, and and March but that's the direction I'm leaning right now any other questions any motions I would be glad to make the motion to consider ordinance and fixing rates and charges and fees. Okay. As presented. Motion number three. Okay. I will second. Okay. Um, it's an ordinance, so we don't need a roll call. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Um, we take a break. We will. I just didn't know if we had to say anything specific about the stage three rates now. Uh, or can we, can the way it's no, no, or no, no. It's in. It's right. Okay. I don't know if Emma, uh, the protest officer, needs to re read out yeah. anything, Bob. Oh, yeah. yeah she, she already did give us the. Uh, yeah, I, I can give a little bit more information. Okay. okay. Um, so of the approximate fifteen thousand eight hundred ser service connections. Uh, 7,901 protests would constitute a legal rejection of the proposed increases. This is 50% plus one. So at, as of 4 p.m. today, I received 239 protest letters. All protests were received were recorded and not all of those were valid. Um, so some of them were missing a couple, an APN or something like that, but that's the full number. Okay. So of the 239 protests, 230 opposed both the water rate and the service charges. Zero opposed just the service charge. Nine were opposed to just the water rates. And this represents less than 1.5% of district customers. And then just to note, since the start and end of the public hearing, I've gotten 16, about 16. Additional. Okay. 18. 18. 18 Thank you for more. doing that. Okay. So and that's been read. Um, also included in the count that um, Emma provided are some duplicate um, protest notices where one APN has received more than one it. protest. So okay. that's when she said they weren't all valid. And I'll, I'll just mention that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but where they did come in, like without an APN, staff worked to put that APN for them. So just not to disqualify it on a technicality or something. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So. This has been one long item.
um, two hours and 20 minutes. So um, we're going to take a five minute break and we will reconvene. Gentlemen, um, we're going to reconvene the meeting. Uh, Director Lather will be here shortly, I assume. But we're going to start back. It's been 10 minutes. Um, the next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. Is there anyone who wishes to pull anything from Nothing. consent? 3.4. Okay, 3.4. 3.4 and 3.8. Eight. And then um, I'll make the motion to approve the. Hold on, just a sec. I just want to see if anybody in the oh. public had anything they wanted to pull from consent. Thank you. It's a little distracted. Is um, item three point four being pulled? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, that's okay. All right. So now I'll make the motion to. I'll second it. The why, don't, why don't we wait till Rochelle comes back and see if she have wants anything pulled? Okay. Well, I mean it. I don't know we can either. continue with those two because they're clearly. Okay, well, let's go ahead and uh, that's fine. We don't have to vote on that right now. Right now, three point four then. Well, production reports. So, I think there's a lot of interesting information conveyed in these reports, and one thing is on page two forty two of the packet, there's a graph that shows the residential gallons per capita per day, and it also shows the monthly production uh, percent difference from 2013. So the black line, the squiggly line, is the monthly production uh, percent difference from 2013, and the blue bars are the residential gallons per capita per day. And what's interesting there is just how seasonal the the uh, the the pattern is. With um, and it clearly shows that during the winter time, it's around uh, 40 or 45, sometimes up to 50 uh, gallons per capita per day, and then in the summertime, it's up to as high as. Uh, 65 or or more and so I find that really interesting I mean that's obviously outdoor water use versus indoor water use and actually and um, then on page the page before 241 it shows how per month um, the production which is related to the residential water use and also to the commercial water use, but it shows how it shows that same pattern in terms of the rebound. Where the rebound is happening is during the months of the year where more outdoor water use is happening. So that's in the um, May through November, sometimes into November. And but during the the winter months, there's not. There's not a rebound from the, the you know, the 2015 or 2016 low use, or there's, there's less of a rebound. Well, there's a, a, yeah, there's still a rebound. A little bit of a rebound. So I think that's really instructive. It, what, it, what, it, what I get from that is that people are not using uh, as much water as they were pre-drought still during indoors, but where, where the increase is happening is outdoors. And um, so people can, uh, people can decrease their water use and still, um, and still have, um, you know, th there's room for people to still increase if, if, if less water, outdoor water use is used. Yep. That's, Got it. that's what I get from it. And then I think um, 
Ms. Steinbrenner had a question on that item as well. Did you have any comment on that? Order me? Yeah. Um, no, I, the, your, your evaluation is accurate that it looks like the rebound is mostly happening in the, in the summer months. Um, and uh, that uh, graph that you were referring to does also have uh, the running annual average of the gallons per person per capita per day, and it's, it's been, for the past year, it's been 53 to 55. Okay. Okay, Ms. Steinberg. Thank you. Thank you for um, pulling this item because I thought it was really, inf really interesting information too. Um, I was able to actually look at a color <laughs> version, but but I really am grateful for Ms. Olin printing these packets out for me in advance so that I can study them a bit in advance of the meetings here. So the, the pieces of information that I also thought was interesting was the production. And um, Director Jaffe, you called attention to um, page 241. That's actually the aromas aquifer. Page 240 is the Prisma aquifer. And what really caught my interest and attention was how production has pretty much uh, steadily declined with a, a few bumps last year because Governor Brown declared the drought over, but we'll forgive him for that. And, and I think that that decrease in production, and this is from 2010 to 2019, that's, that's rather remarkable. Um, but since 2015, uh, uh, 13, production has declined every year. And then if you go to page uh, 244, which I thought was really interesting because it compares from 1965 to 2018, uh, the number of services, which has gone upward steadily, as we all know, and you've got a bunch more here you're going to probably approve tonight, um, the production has gone down since 2005, a sharp decline in production. So I have to ask you, do you really need this Pure Water SoCal project? Can you uh, delay the project? for another two years and allow these numbers to play out a bit and to uh, work with the city cooperatively to see what they're going to do in 2020. I think you really need to pause here because these figures do not lie. And you can have all the helicopters flying over doing snapshot studies, but these figures don't lie. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about this. Thank you. Um, I, yes, sir. I'll respond to that. Okay. Which one? Um, we have another one on this item, 3.4. On production, yes. Okay. Um, and I'll be briefer than three minutes. I've watched Jerry Paul come in here. I've interviewed him. I've looked at his studies for the Lockerford program. I've evaluated them with other experts in water and hydrology. I have watched this board be asked and implored to maybe fund ten or twenty thousand dollars to evaluate the Lokofer program, going back at least five years and maybe seven. And this board negligently failed to do any of that. The Lokofer program has a budget estimate, eighteen to twenty-three million dollars tops. It would provide enough water to have started recharging the aquifers in question long ago, and it could still do that. So I would urge you to look at that production alternative of 18 to 23 million dollars, and by the way, it's mainly rainwater derived water, and it stores rainwater in the aquifer as, it's, as Jerry provides. So I'd urge you to do that before you think about spending another dime of other people's money and committing maybe 50 to 100 million dollars in debt to be spread among 15,000 ratepayers in the Soquel Water Creek District, I don't find that responsible. So in terms of production, you've got an alternative to the Lockerfer system, so please scoop up some money, contact Jerry Paul, and evaluate Lockerfer. The next thing to evaluate is the production possibility of consolidation 
of this district and the city of Santa Cruz or consolidation regionally for production purposes by the state. That would be an efficient, intelligent, and consistent with the evidence solution. Thank you. All right, um, you had a, a few comments. Um, I know that Jerry Paul and, and friends have uh, presented the aquifer solution to the WASAC, the Water Supply Advisory Committee, the city committee that was putting together a solution. He's presented to the Water Commission. I don't know whether he's pre pre presented to the, uh, the actual council, but I wouldn't be surprised. And they have they've taken a few of these ideas and incorporated it in their plans, but basically they've rejected it over and over and over again. So why should we put money into something the city has already rejected? Because it's the city's water, it's the city's project, it's the city's supply, and so without the city agreeing to want no, to do it, we would no, be you already had your comment down period. the toilet. No, we're not, not, we're the not doing a back and forth. Excuse me, me public comment. The Colonel Maxwell, do you want to be removed? The You've had your comment The rainwater is not the aquifer. The rainwater, the aquifer is rainwater derived, not from Excuse the city. Excuse me. This okay. is not a response. Bruce? Um, can I, I if, have to if have they were to come to oh, wait, wait, no, let's not go back and forth. Okay, please. I'd like to make a comment on this as soon as Dr. Daniels is done, too. Okay, I just, um, yeah. I may we, need to have. called. There was also a I comment mean, about, uh, you know, the, the, these production numbers. And I think the thing we have to remember is that every time someone builds something in our district, they have to not only uh, offset their usage, they have to offset 200% of their usage. So actually, Turns out every time somebody builds something here, we save some water. Now, that's not why we do it, but we set it up that way so that it wouldn't get worse. So there was an, a reason why building might lead to lower production, because when it comes online, its water use is offset, plus some ex an extra 100% is offset. So that's part of this whole process. And unfortunately, we've kind of run out of offsets. I mean, we're doing this, this project right now, this uh, um, AMI project, which I know you uh, didn't like, uh, but you know that's that's giving us another 80 acre feet of offset credits, and when that's gone, I don't know where we go. So we we probably have none after that. There will that. be none. So that that'll have to stop. At that point, we'd have to do a you know some kind of a, a stop of all de development. Moratorium. Moratorium, it's called. Yeah. Right on. Yeah, I'll, I'll make a couple comments. Uh, number one, uh, production has uh, steadily uh, increased slowly in the last couple of years, so the previous comment um, from a speaker is incorrect. And where you can best see that is actually on the graph on the screen. We were at a low in around May 2015. This is percent cutback. You can see a slow incline of water, uh, more water being used, shown by um, less water being saved that, in, that if you do a, a line through those zigzags you'll see it increasing there the other thing is we're in stage three and we have the water demand offset program uh, so we're trying to hold people back in the uh, on a state level um, when uh, most of the other agencies when they have recently lifted the drought curtailment they went from a 20 percent water savings to a 0.8 in nine months so they all the conservation savings vanished in nine months. And that's because they said, you know, it, it rained and the governor declared that off. But we've also seen that in the past where it's rebounded very quickly. That hasn't been when we've had a stage three, but I think it's important to remember that as, as we view these numbers. And I, I, I just want to give kudos to actually the district conservation staff, because if you look at the graph on page 244, and, and the leadership from the board that changed around the year 2000. Yeah. Um, 2002. One, no, yeah. 2002. And yeah. so, I mean, it, w even with, in the face of, you know, moderate rise in number of services, production went down because our customers did such a good job. Our, our, our water conservation department did such a good job and, and, and there was leadership to try and get there. So, yeah. you know, I, I, every once in a while there's some good news there we need to celebrate it is and and that's demonstrated i think on page 243 between the separation of the red lines and the i'm going to call them right. blue the production where the temperature stays up high and what our production used to mimic that the climate right and now it's dropped down so yeah, yeah. good and uh, staff and customers 
Yeah. Right. All right. So that was three point four. Um, Carla, you asked for three point eight. Uh, three. Yeah, it was the results of the um, subcommittee, the committee on uh, water supply, water supply infrastructure, mm -hmm. and uh, Taj, uh, DeFore, and Christine. Me, they presented the some early data on the pilot transfer study, uh, and I just wanted to pull up the results of that. What is she? Oh, that's I'm 256. 256, thanks. Item 3.8, I think. Yeah, page 261. Okay, so you're in the PowerPoint. Uh, yeah, in terms of the purity of the water, there, there was some interesting early results because uh, that whole purpose of this study has been to look for, you know, look for how it would look to have a water, Santa Cruz City water in SoCal Creek Water District pipes and serving it to our customers. And so, so the whole purpose of it is to take samples and, and collect data on the chemical content, the water analysis, and the early analyses are a little disquieting. Maybe, Christine, you want to comment on that? There are two uh, graphs in um, the minutes from that meeting um, on disinfection and byproducts. One, the first graph is on trihalomethanes, and the second is for haloacetic acids. And since the city uses surface water, they have a higher organic content in their water, which translate to higher concentrations of DBP, so that we are seeing that um, in our monitoring. Um, and uh, this is when we open it up to um, the larger part of our distribution system next year, um, the water age will increase, and so I wouldn't be surprised if we saw these results go even higher when the water, because he's um, at least the trihalomethanes, as the water ages, those levels increase over time. So the water in this in the pilot zone um, is not that old. Yeah, we don't have much room for adding any more. Yeah, they oh, the red line is the further the say that these the MCL, uh, right? chemicals are they're not innocuous. It was for many years that chlorination is was the godsend of treating water because it uh, was very effective at eliminating pathogens, which were very hazardous to people drinking water. But, and it was just accepted as a side, a necessary side effect. But uh, I did work with the National Cancer Institute and the National Toxicology Program years ago. And the, this is the focus of their early uh, assessments because a lot of these compounds are carcinogenic. They are not, they aren't healthy chemicals to have in our water. We in the SoCal Creek Water District are really lucky to have very low levels naturally in the water because we have not that much organic matter in our system. But uh, that is why there's a red line at the top of this graph. That's the, the state's reportable concentration. And uh, as was reported in the committee, the water that was uh, introduced from Santa Cruz City was headed up to that reportable level. So that would be the first time that our district had that kind of uh, reporting obligation. But they mixed, and I'm pretty sure that Santa Cruz City must have to mix, be very careful and constantly mix their different sources of water to keep those levels down for their customers as much as possible. But yeah. So right, I think that their different sources have different organic mm -hmm. content, so th that creates higher um, disinfectant byproducts. Mm -hmm. I think, um, I think actually the lock may have the higher organic That's content. That would be the typical thing. Yeah. 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 Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. So that's that, that's all I wanted to point out. I wish more customers, you know, from the rate uh, rate discussion, were here to really here that water transfers are not you know an easy thing to uh, they're they're going to be just as complicated as any other water source supplemental water supply that we look for there are going to be pros and cons things that have to be dealt with and things that might be cost costly to de deal with also okay. at, at the meeting I mentioned the fact that 
you know, these high levels we see on the right-hand side of that graph are basically from just the injection of the city's water into our distribution pipes. And as over time, they'll gradually become higher levels in the tanks that we have. So some will get piped up into the tanks, and, and so the tanks will have a higher distribution of that. And over time, you know, we've, we've actually seen some of the contributions on the left, the low levels, as they sit in the tanks with the chlorine that's there, they eventually go up and they never have gotten up to the red, I don't think, but they've gotten much closer. So take those over on the right and move those up the same amount. And yeah, we could have some big problems. And uh, so we might actually have to treat the water we get from the Santa Cruz city uh, somehow to, to reduce organic matter, to reduce organic matter, do something with it to, to make it so that the tank or not use the tanks, which would be a real problem because we got about two days supply in the tanks in case there's a disaster or something. And to have to do without those, uh, I don't, that, that would be unsafe, I think, so. All right, so anybody would make a motion on I the consent agenda I items? I really wanted to just thank you for considering the stormwater capture and moving that forward because I'm bugging them at the golf course all the time <laughs> about it. <laughs> and I'm bugging you guys about it because I believe in having various ways of getting our groundwater replenished and stormwater especially when you see the flooded road and I'm walking my dog down it, I think about what we could be doing with it rather than that, so thank you. Anything else, Christine? Okay, and then you had a comment on this item, Ms. Steinbrenner. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. I was at this committee meeting and um, I thought it was very interesting. I want to thank the district for watching these levels of contamination. Um, but there was a question raised at that committee for which there was no answer. What, it, what are the city levels of these contaminants that people within the city of Santa Cruz uh, drink? And I'm not saying that just because people drink it, it's okay. And, and, and I'm uh, curious to see that it is here. But I also want to say that um, I did attend the Santa Cruz City Water Advisory Commission meeting when Isidro gave the report on to that commission on the water surface water transfer, and this was in early January. He reported that um, the water transfer has actually improved their water quality because their water does not age. It it's keeps it fresher. So I would expect with an expanded uh, surface water uh, project that maybe hopefully next year will in incorporate service areas one and two for the district that you would see an improvement in these figures. Um, so I would like a discussion from maybe Christine has those uh, numbers uh, that Santa Cruz City often sees in there. And if, if this is an issue, then maybe uh, the district could look at putting in a further surface water cleansing akin to the Pure Water SoCal, but with a much cleaner source. As Monica McGuire pointed out, sewage has synergistic chemical reactions within it, and that is well known. And so you can't test for everything because you don't know what is in sewage water because things react. And the difference in using sewage water and treating it with advanced water purification could be much, um, can, has much different outcomes because there are things like pharmaceuticals and radioactive uh, elements that people take in their bodies for chemotherapy that you can't get out. And there are no drinking water standards for, and there are things that you can't test for because you don't know they're there. So. If these levels are, are troublesome to you regarding future and expanded surface water um, transfers, let's look at cleaning up the stream water so that these problems are not within your district customer service areas rather than you as sewage water. Thank you. And anyone else want to comment on the specifically the Water Resources Management and Infrastructure Committee meeting summary? Yes, I would. 
because none of you said the other piece that is follow on to what Becky just said. I'm Monica McGuire again. I it is beyond me that we have to bring this to you, but common sense, we ask you to please address the common sense that yes, you would have to treat the surface water, which would absolutely by every definition be at least 100 times less of an effective treatment needed compared to toilet water. Simple, common sense, just because surface water also needs treatment, anyone can understand that toilet water needs an incredibly large amount more. And as we've asked over and over, please address these common sense questions that we have brought to you all of these years in order to assuage this feeling that gets to people calling what you say lies because it makes no sense that that hasn't been addressed and it makes no sense that when you talk about between the two um, municipalities that you haven't done what people asked which was show us where you've gone through real efforts to say we have this marriage made in heaven so again those things should be coming up at every single meeting where you're working with anyone else in the county for all our sake, for the children's sake, for fairness sake, for logic and common sense sake. I ask multiple times within three minutes one point because multiple times over a year it never got addressed and it's always good to get at least three minutes to say something that we're still asking for. Thank you. Okay, consent agenda. This is, this is on this report as well. Yes. Um, I was very interested to hear that you said you used to work with the National Toxicology Program. Yeah. And um, the problems with chlorine. It brought to my mind that um, some years ago I read about the toxicity of chlorine and that there was an international body of scientists who felt that chlorine was so toxic um, that it really should not be used. And uh, the article was in Rachel's Environment and Health News, named after Rachel Carson, the Chlorine Chemical Council, representing the industry producing the chlorine, did this huge campaign to assure that chlorine would still be used. And I, I often think of these two questions that are pertinent here. Why is this happening and who benefits? Why do we have so many toxins spewed into our environment? Why is that allowed and who is benefiting? The corporations producing them not us. These toxins end up in our bodies. The umbilical cords of babies, I think, have something like 140 chemicals or more. I myself, I might have mentioned before, was in the lawsuit to ban the carcinogenic pesticide DDT coming on 50 years now, it was 1969. And all us nursing mothers had DDT in our breast milk. I mean, I was just devastated. How, why are these corporations allowed to contaminate everything? And then you and we and everyone is supposed to, uh, you know, they profit, you know, and, and what is it? You know, we pay for the cost. This is all wrong. How do we stop the toxic sources? It's really, uh, we're in a, big amount of trouble and I think the system is a toxic system where profit is prioritized over the proven health <coughs> and safety of what the corporations are producing really disturb me. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Comment. Comment on that. Yeah I was have to say uh, just the introduction of chlorination to the water supply, the nation's water supply, has been a great boon to the safety in general of the waters of water. It was only more recently that 
uh, new techniques, you know, for analyses and for evaluation. That's how these com compounds were discovered to be toxic. But it's still better than pathogen pathogens in your water supply. That just goes without saying. But it does really, there are other ways, and one way to purify water, of course, is the Pure Water Soquel project that we're thinking about. And, but that is, you know, that has other, obviously some people are unhappy with that, but it, it takes chlorine, you know, chlorinated byproducts out of the water. So at least at that very, you know, that one we can assure of, be assured of. But it is a fundamental uh, detoxification, I mean, disinfectant. We, we put chlorine in there because it's required. State law requires us to put chlorine in there. Now, you can ki kill bacteria with other things. For example, ultraviolet light kills bacteria, but the problem is that's only on a particular location, and it's not then in the distribution system. So if you have a leak in the distribution system, the chlorine will still be in there and kill the bacteria, whereas ultraviolet light is going to be long gone, and so you can get people poisoned by that way because this, the leak in, this, in the distribution system would get into the pipes, and then go on into people's drinking water. So that's why, is that it, it does serve a benefit. It does have problems though, because most toxics are related to chlorine uh, in the interactions. Okay. I would love to get through the consent agenda. <laughs> yeah. well, uh, I'm finished. I know, I'm okay, just saying it's, it's, it's nine o'clock um, and we're at the consent agenda. Of, uh, the remaining items. I'll second all, it. Well, all of the items yes. because we have not. Yes. Even done. No. We did no. The other one. no. We never voted because Rochelle was not here. Oh, oh, oh. sorry. So okay. Okay. We held it for you. Oh, so thank you. The motion would be <laughs> all. all. <laughs> okay. That's the motion that I make. Okay. I'll second. <laughs> all in favor? <laughs> Aye. 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 Opposed? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now it's time for oral communications, which is for items not on the agenda. Roaring along here. Becky Steinbrenner, can I just have one clarification? I was watching when you were voting for the um, r the rate increase, and Director Lather, how did you vote? I you didn't. Know, you she didn't vote. Okay. She did not vote. All right, four to, mm -hmm. four to zero to one. Okay, because it seemed like it was reported unanimous. So You're I just right. want to make that you. clear for the record. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I didn't hear a nay either, though. I did not say nay, but she I didn't did say anything. Say yeah, <laughs> interesting. Okay, so it's an abstention, I guess. I guess so. So that needs to be recorded. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, I want to first of all um, let you know that in the recent meetings I've gone to regarding the um, environmental review underway for the water amendment or right water amendment water rights amendments for the San Lorenzo River with the city of Santa Cruz uh, Rosemary Renard uh, did report that the projected demand for the city is flat through 2040 and I thought that was very interesting your your That's information true. here also supports that trend and her uh, that comment was again repeated in the um, very excellent workshop that the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency put on in Felton regarding the connection between growth and water use, which we've talked about here a lot. It's a real broken process at the county. Um, I also want to point out that um, John Ricker has recently re released and the Board of, of Supervisors approved the county's uh, annual water report. So I urge you to look at that. It's very interesting too. And um, I was also at the Mid-County Groundwater Advisory Committee um, Enrichment Workshop last week wherein uh, Cameron talked about the model and uh, how it was built and the impacts. And he said some very interesting things. Um, it was at the Community Foundation that the Parisma Aquifer can be um, healed essentially in five years, um, 10 years max, if 1,500 acre feet a year are recharged. 
So I thought that was a very quick timeline. I was surprised, and he repeated it. He supported it. And he also said that, um, in his opinion, in lieu recharge would be a much more flexible way to recharge and uh, address problem areas within the aquifer. So I think that it behooves you to really examine the flexibility of the pure water SoCal in a fixed position re re recharge area in which the draft environmental impact report has said the aquifer levels have recovered. Thank you. Thank you. All right, <coughs> anyone else on an item not on tonight's agenda? <coughs> I can respond to a little bit of that if you like. I mean, Cameron did call me later and thought okay, his sure. words might be Let's clarify. misconstrued. Um, he said that people are confusing in lieu with the thought that it's just uh, transfer water, that sort of thing. In that context, what he said he was indicating was that, like with Pure Water Soquel, the flexibility of putting uh, that the MGA could look at is putting water in a certain area so you don't have to have a large infrastructure, pumping more out of that area and resting other wells along the coast. So in, in lieu, resting, pumping of Got those it. wells and creating more of an iron curtain. So, okay, thank you. He, he did call me on that. Okay. And on another item not on tonight's agenda. Yes. Um, Mr. Richard Andre, the esteemed elder who was here explaining that he has been a college professor and had taught on legal and uh, news items came out to speak with me about the fact that he wanted to come back uh, at this time but could not because he had to drive back to Carmel but he is an expert on the Brown Act and he said uh, everything that I had said and everything that many other people had said was entirely legal because there were no personal attacks there were no uh, no ways in any, in any form that anyone was in danger or disrupted. It was entirely appropriate to show emotion and say, we are not being answered. And to quote, as I did, that we have been asked, we have been asking over and over for answers to specific questions that have been dodged and or misanswered, answered with specious non-answers. And that is exactly what the Brown Act is there for, more to protect us to make sure that we are listened to and answered. So his request was that somebody come in since he couldn't, since he had to drive home, and that was what I wanted to uh, say. We have watched you not put what we ask about on the agenda, not do any communication back and forth with us, over and over tell us that we can speak but that you're not allowed to answer us and he said that is absolutely wrong and please look it up and please make sure that it's on the record that we have been treated absolutely abominably by you and that that is the problem here. So please take into account everything that Becky Steinbrenner has said as an incredible resource who comes to you over and over with help and then teaches the rest of us to look at the facts and talk about common sense and request over and over to be answered. And then we have the right to say it's really awful that you answer us with not common sense and with specious answers. I, I can't ask it another clearer way, but the Brown Act is worth looking into and actually talking about that. Thank you. Thank you to the previous speakers. Um, living in what we're told is a democracy, I always think in part that the people are represented and that when there's a presentation of anything, you hear pros and cons. You hear one perspective, you hear another. And my thought today on listening to the districts about our presentation, I thought it would have been appropriate to have Becky Steinbrunner on the other perspective and what's in her appeal. Things are often very one-sided in selling products or whatever. You just pass the consent agenda. There's something called informed consent when we are exposed to certain toxins. 
I was listening to Barry Trower in one of his interviews. He worked in the British Secret Service in the 60s and 70s with a specialty in microwave radiation weaponry. And he was talking about the exposure to wireless microwave radiation, and now we have 5G coming, as um, an issue uh, that uh, violates the Nuremberg Treaties after World War II. I'm going to get the exact language. But basically, it is illegal to be experimenting on people without their informed consent, with the exception that if it's a medical doctor who wants to experiment on him or herself with certain exposures to chemicals or radiation, that's permissible. This whole wireless microwave technology, in the language of the industry, they're looking to see what happens to people. It's an experiment. And I think that the same with your so-called smart meters. Where is your informed consent where people have been told of the science that shows the links to diabetes, heart problems, mental health issues, causing DNA strand breaks, insomnia, that you have a signed informed consent form from everybody. Just because wireless microwave technology is popular doesn't mean it's safe. It's the opposite. Thank you. I'll pass this out again. I have something not on the agenda and uh, independent of anything you said before. Uh, my life's journey included working for Ralph Nader when I was young and idealistic. And one of the things Ralph told me, and he repeated it at a reunion we had several years ago in Washington, to protect the public interest and to do what's right regarding the public interest and not be dominated by greedy corporations or corrupt others is to look at the big picture, Terry, and looking at the big picture, what is the most honest and the best thing f to look at the public interest in first that regard. And the big picture here is we have a water situation and we have a drought situation and we have all these polyglot water districts, of which this is one, and we have the city of Santa Cruz right there nearby adjacent that could consolidate. So let us offer Ms. Menard consolidation. That's been on the table also years here. And it's been abused and it's been neglected and it's been sidelined improperly by members of LAFCO most recently, and this board. I urge you to propose consolidation, because maybe a group of us citizens should demand that like Ralph Nader taught me. Consolidate this with the city of Santa Cruz, and then we don't have to worry about where the water comes from and that their excess that's going out to the Pacific a little could be diverted here. So maybe con it's, if we don't have consolidation with the city of Santa Cruz, then let us have a state or federal takeover of the entire region, which might even make a lot more sense in terms of, as Ralph taught me, look at the big picture. So there's my big picture proposal to your audience, your ratepayers, and yourselves. And I think the most intellectually honest thing you might consider is voting tonight to consolidate with Santa Cruz. Thank you. All right, anyone from the board? Ready to move on? Okay. We had a management update. <coughs> yeah, so since it's a late night, um, I think we're, maybe the managers just want to say a couple words. We'll keep it brief, though. Hi, the only thing I'd like to add is that the well serves on tonight's agenda represent kind of the tail end of the projects that were on our wait list. So any future um, well serves that we will be bringing will be completely new and there'll probably be a lot fewer the next few meetings so just wanted to point that out any questions on any of the other items stormwater right. I appreciate you moving forward with the stormwater yeah yeah that was a uh, good meeting good okay Thank any you. questions no nope. all right seeing none we'll any questions for Christine 
No. Um, I just did want to add one um, item from my uh, report. Uh, the city contacted us today to say that we could resume um, full capacity of the inner tie after they asked us on February 6th to cut back 50%. Okay. Good. Thank you, Christine. Anyone else on staff? Melanie, you're up. Nothing. Okay. Okay. And finance, she's probably done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then, Tracy, you're good. Yep. Um, Ron? Yeah, just uh, Pure Water Monterey. Look, they sent an article. They're about 80% done with construction. And then the other thing, if you could go down just a little bit there, um, this just kind of struck my eye. Um, it's Stanislaus River, um, June. Uh, predicted flows and you can just uh, out through time you can see a steady decrease there um, I'm sure some of that must be snowpack related and whatnot but um, it's still it's a it shows the impact and the whole source of this was a Stanford study saying um, nothing that you don't already know but uh, climate change is fundamentally transforming the way we manage water in the western US a big chunk of that is evaporation every time temperature goes up one degree evaporation increases by four percent and they're predicting something like six, seven degrees of in temperature rise. So they and we can get something like a 24% reduction in our water supply in a normal year just from the evaporation increase. That's the scary thing. Yeah. In fact, the last drought that we were familiar with, the 2015 drought, 15% of that drought was not caused by lack of rain, but by evaporation of the little bit of rain that we did get. Yeah. Okay. That's our future. All right, um, so that is the management report. Any <coughs> comments from the public on that? Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner of Aptos. I <coughs> have a question about uh, page 271. It's a little hard to read, but um, it, uh, <coughs> it shows, to me, it shows that the Main Street well is very <coughs> responsive and levels come up very quickly when it's um, when the water transfers were in progress and then off over to the right it shows uh, that the the level quickly went down within the well when the amount of water transfer volume was reduced I wonder if staff can explain just talk about this information a little bit and analyze it for the public I think that's, I'm, I'm okay with that too. Just thank you, Becky. Thank I, you. Just if there's any clarification on that graph for, I, I, for us I, or the public. Christine, I'll take a, just a, a, a bigger shot. I think it's what some of the modeling shown without a constant source, once you stop recharging, you get dramatic decrease. So what goes up relatively quickly or modestly, it's a slope there, but it drops off quickly once you stop. Is the and oh. I'm sorry, I, uh, I guess I, another way I could have said instead of 50% reduction in water transfer volume, I could have said Main Street well came back online because we were asked to reduce the water transfer volume by 50%. So the, that drop in water level reflects the fact that that well was going back online. And every time you see that water level go up and down, that's the pump turning on and off. Great. Thank you. Can I ask a no, question? No. Yeah. Um, can you, the, where it says recharge, that's just from rainwater? No. That's the actual injection of the, of the city's water into Belts 12. Oh. It's ASR, aquifer storage so, and retrieval. Oh, that's the other project. And, sorry, the, and the recovery I'm means tired. the extraction. I, yeah. Yes. I'm tired. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great. Um, so we can move on then to the district council. There's nothing important enough in 920 to report on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, the next then is uh, item 6.1, conditional and unconditional will serves. I'm here to answer any of your questions. Questions? No? Public comments. Any members of the public on this item? Yes, I do. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. I just want to note in um, 
Ms. Flock's report on page uh, 269 that the um, total offset a, balance. Is that a different uh, item? Well, it's related, isn't it? No. The no. water demand offset amount of credits that you've got and you're ready to issue a bunch of will serves. It, it, well, you can address it via up. the will serves. Go ahead and make your point. It's half used up already. And you have no measurable success from your installation of the AMI meters that gave you these numbers that are allowing you to grant all of these new conditional uh, services. So how are you justifying this? Are you done? Yes, but I'd like an answer. Thank you. Thank you. I'm actually having sleepless nights again, worrying about these will serves. I'm having issues, so I agree with Becky on that. Well, I mean, the, the way I understood it is, you know, these are, the t that the timing would work, that the timing by the time, I mean, these are not built. These are will serves. Right. They won't be extracting water for a while. Um, so these are not projects that are going to be there before the AMI is installed. So it's trust. No. Right. I know. But that was that was staff's assessment when we when we approved I the know. AMI project. I know. And I'm having second thoughts about my vote for that too. And I brought that up last <laughs> meeting and that's one of the reasons I voted. Mm -hmm. And then then as I recall as I recall because of the uncertainty and how much water savings there would be, we discounted that mm -hmm. pretty, I know. pretty strongly. Right. I so. just feel like we're asking people to raise, to take pay more, and then we're letting new people in. Okay, I understood. Understood. Yeah. But you know, we we went over this whole idea as a as a board and and, a, and looked at the timing and and approved this. I mean, we. If um, right now we just have the will serves in front of us, so. so that's a new topic. No, we've already started that topic, and you already spoke on it. People already. Sp well, no, this AMI is a new topic. These nope. Ones are a new topic. Excuse me. No, we're, uh, it's not. How can you not take comments? Uh, it's not an AMI comments. <laughs> this is we're on item six point one. Has he spoken on the will Period. yet? Yeah. And he didn't stand up. Oh. Did you want to did you want to speak on the will serve? Yeah, go ahead. That's fine. Mrs. Steinbrenner went up and then no one else was there, so we well, moved she made on. Her points clear. And she pointed out that the AMI data apparently is not fully available. Secondly, people well trust us. We're gonna let people go in advance approve the will serves? How can you do that until you have all the AMI data? And how can you improve any will serves given the, the, the threat to the aquifer daily from the over extraction being done by this water district? You should suspend any such will serves. And I suspect there's some, quite frankly, some corruption behind some of these will serves that you're so eager to approve, Dr. LeHue. That's my suspicion well, as a smart member of the public and a guy who's worked with Ralph Nader watching government officials not be honest. Go ahead and finish. Okay? So there's lots of suspicion here. You should not approve any such will serve until you have as Be Becky's criteria is fully resolved. That's obvious. That's logical and it's honest. And it's also legal in all probability under the Brown Act and other provisions under which you have authority in California. So, um, and we're just talking about these will serves right now. Um, you know, I'm a school teacher and I'm a veterinarian. I'm trying to do the best I can serving on the board as well. I have no connection to any of this stuff, okay? So I'm sorry that you're suspicious of everyone, but you're not going to find that here. Um, uh, any any yeah, movement for well, <laughs> Rochelle, if you want to... If, if somebody you wants to change my mind from when I changed my mind, I think Terry could help that. <laughs> he said. So, Rochelle, if you want to <laughs> propose re-agendizing this, yeah, you should do that. Okay. Okay. That would right. be, the, that would be the way to do it. Right the, now, we've this, approved this the being project. about the the 
modern man offset in the credits from I mean, the EMI. Right. Yeah. And, and we have customers that we've told about the program that we did approve and we've told them how to proceed and they have proceeded according to our guidelines. So. Yeah, the, I think district has done a lot of due diligence and research on the AMI. You know, it looked promising enough to propose it. We should agendize it and talk yeah. about right. it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's a separate separate item. It's not, it, 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 it makes you uneasy because you're not related. seeing the results and it's related and I understand the discussion. Or you can do what I did last meeting and vote no. It'll still pass, but you at least have expressed your displeasure. Yeah. But when can I, I bang on the table too? <laughs> sure. Well, you know, sometimes it's right. And that's fine. And people can, everyone's free to vote the way they want. I just, I feel like it's a little bit tough to change what we decided on on people who are already we've told them how to proceed mm -hmm. so you're building a house or an ADU and you've gotten guidance from the district that this is how you proceed and and then suddenly in midstream you change I mean I think if we want to bring re-agendize the item that's perfectly fine and then give them new guidance mm -hmm. being fair to those people that have already been given other guidance but I would hate to be the customer that was, you know, told one thing and then, and then, you know, told something different. So I actually don't, you know, I th anyway, I guess I made my point. Okay. So I'll, I'll make, I'll move approval. Oh, and I'll just second it. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. Opposed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. We are now going to item 6.2, approve water main extension agreement with City of Capitola. This should be pretty controversial. Can I just make one motion? Well, we can um, get up Not there. yet. <laughs> 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 yeah, and public comment. We need to have Questions? public comment. Mm. Uh, it's mm -hmm. available. That too. <coughs> okay. Any questions on the, you don't have questions. <laughs> okay. Um, any, any members of the public have Question on item 6.2 or comment? Okay. okay, seeing none, do you want to make, make your motion? motion? I'll second it. Moved and seconded. Um, all in favor? <coughs> Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that motion carries unanimously. Last item is 6.3 on the this section, administrative business is surplus property sale. Yes, we have, um, mainly uh, two surplus trucks that we would like to um, have deemed surplus and um, and get bids to uh, sell them. There's also a 350 kilowatt load bank. Um, one thing to note on one of the uh, trucks, the old unit 16, um, whether or not we go through with the sale on that is dependent on the results of um, going out to bid for uh, meter register replacements. If, if we do not get sufficient amount of qualified bids for that, we may um, uh, hire a temporary employee to do that, and so that truck would okay. be used for that sort of purpose. But um, we'd like the flexibility of either adding that to the next surplus sale or not. Okay. Um, Anyone in the public wish to comment on this item? Sale of surplus items. Um, could you explain this in more detail? I attend Board of Supervisors <laughs> meetings as well, and I often see, it's not unusual, surplus county property or surplus um, like this, vehicles, I guess you're talking about right now. How do you define that? And I'm, I'm thinking when they're talking about property that it's county property. It belongs to the county and the people of the county. And if it's sold, it's taking that out of the public hands. I'm very, I'm, I don't, it's so these perplexing. Are Could you explain how you define how you determine what is surplus and is something still very usable when it's called surplus? Like an old truck that's no longer 
usable for the district, something like that. But staff the wants to give it the district funds. It's not lost. Nobody from the district can purchase any of these surplus item. It has to be a bid from public members who maybe it's not serving the district anymore, but they could use it. So they bid on it. And we get some money. And we get some money that goes into the district used for other item, other things. So it's just, do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, I, I mean, it's, it's any item that has resale value that d doesn't fit the district's needs anymore or is obsolete. Right. So, and all of these items fit that description. Got it. All right. I'll, I'll, make, I'll make the motion. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. The last item before a closed session is uh, written communications. Um, anyone have any questions or comments on that? Present. Any public comment? I do. Thank you. My name is Becky Steinbrunner, and I sent to your board an email because something very odd happened at the end of last meeting. Um, I, I check your website a lot these days, and immediately after the last board meeting, the video was up. And I thought, oh, that's great. I'll watch and just um, recap what I said before the, the board regarding the, um, the legal action, regarding the CEQA action. And, and it was very odd because that part of the video was missing. And it was a Vimeo. And um, so I had worried about that happening because sometimes the man that does the recording here, um, it, it isn't always that the uh, uh, body allows the public to comment before a closed session. And so I had worried that he assumed that you would not allow the public to, to speak. And so I actually had my own recorder going when I got up to speak and also recorded the other people that got up to speak about the closed session where you're you were discussing um, the case 19CV00181. But the comment for closed session was missing in that. So that's what prompted me to write this letter. By the end of the day, uh, uh, Victor had contacted me and let me know that it looked like it was up and running then. It was a YouTube, and it included my comment and the comment of others. So I, th I just thought that was very odd. Yeah. And I just want to explain to you why I wrote this message to sense. you, and that it did get corrected, but initially, the c public comment for the closed session had been omitted. And there were the, the, co the titles, you know, the subtitles, roll call, all that. That was there. It was very jerky, like it had been cut and edited. But it was on a Vimeo. And the public comment in closed session was omitted. But I am happy that it was corrected. Well, and it good. is available now for the public to view. Great. Thank you very Thank much. Thanks for checking that. Um, all right, so um, we will now go to closed session. and. Um, Anybody has any comments before closed session? <laughs> That's okay. I'm gonna. I'm. You know. Why not? Thank you. That is part of the Brown mm. Act, and yeah. I appreciate your abiding by the Brown Act <laughs> because I you're training on that. Excellent. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I am the person bringing the um, litigation before you, and I want to let you know there is ex, ex parte hearing tomorrow at one o'clock. Um, I am seeking a, a preliminary injunction. And um, temporary restraining order and um, a stay of action. It troubles me that um, the district is choosing to spend $175,000, $172,000 to fight me rather than um, stepping back, pausing, and curing and correcting. Uh, thoroughly allowing the judge to examine my allegations, and in the meantime, you're not stopping. Most legal cases like this would stop all action, and you're not stopping. 
So that's why I'm taking the action tomorrow. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So now we will go to closed session. So. Yep. I, I agree. This case is in process. And I think it's, you know that saying about look before you leap? I think you need to stop right now. Once the aquifer is poisoned and nothing is sure that it's gonna work perfectly, there are often mistakes, then it's gone. And I remember the ads about nuclear power, safe, clean, cheap, so cheap that you wouldn't even need to monitor it. And we have Fukushima and Three Mile Island, et cetera. This is a hazardous step you're taking without the informed consent of those you represent. And it's critical that you stop the sense of smugness that, oh, this is gonna work and this is great and it's gonna solve the saltwater intrusion. I, I just, I, poisons are poisons. And I, I, I think you need to stop. What's, what's going to be the harm of waiting to check how the judge rules and what are the real, what's the real evidence of harm before you proceed? We can think of so many things in history and policy where we've been assured of safety and it's been the opposite. Please pause, stop. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. All right, so um, we're now gonna end the meeting. It's adjourned to a closed session. Thanks everyone. <laughs>